we this is the largest group we're going to have together for the FTS podcast. So I hope that you're all excited. It's uh, going to be an interesting, interesting episode for sure. I just got back from California, did uh, an interesting personal development seminar down there called PSI or People Synergistically Involved uh, for seven days. Um, it echoed a lot of the FTS ethos. FTS, of course, is F the silos, or making sure that you remember that we're all in this game of life together. The, we're all playing a, a game, and it's and how you win in this game is by being together with with people and, and seeing your common humanity. So, uh, yeah. It was a, an amazing experience. The PSI 7 was. Some, some people pronounce it Psi 7. Um, it had all of the elements of, of collaboration, personal responsibility, believing in the capability of other people to to do fantastic, wonderful things and to surprise you. It, uh, it really encouraged um, excellent self-leadership and, and the leadership of others. I, I'd heard of these seminars quite a while back and I'd poo-pooed them thinking they were like, oh, I don't need that crap. I'm doing pretty good. That's for, that's for losers or whatever, but I was wrong. I think everybody can benefit from a, from experiences like that. All right. Pull to the side here. As we pick up our first guest. Sorry, I was distracted with driving and couldn't message you sooner. Because I'm a very lawful driver, I, I drive according to all the rules and regulations. Let's see what I can get. I'll swap this over there. I'll swap this here. Keep it a little bit quieter. So we have an interesting drive today. It's going to be fun. We're going to be picking up three different people. I have some interesting guests lined up, some physician guests. Um, not for today. Oh yes, actually, one of them is a physician today. Um, we have some physicians within um, my health authority region. And I think we're gonna have some interesting discussions there. Um, I'll be getting to know those physicians as well. And you'll see who they are. There's been a, a lot of activity lately on, on Facebook, um, one of them being the Canadian Health and Care Quality Improvement Network. The Canadian Health and Care Quality Improvement Network, or Chaching. The, that's a Facebook group that's a national group, and there are like one or two international members where we're really trying to get people in, who, around, the, around the world or around the, our country in Canada who are interested in improving healthcare and trying to see 
what are some of the the common topics or what are the what are the things that matter to each of these people and there are representatives in administration nursing um, clinicians their patient voices and so it's a quite an inclusive group which is awesome and that of course um, hopefully will eventually align people to uh, maybe hopefully a common vision a common vision of what the priorities are and I don't think that it's been done in this way before so I'm pretty happy with that that we're actually leveraging social media to create that type of community the type of connection to link all the silos together um, and I want to shout out to Doctors of BC for for supporting that. Doctors of BC is kind of a a doctors group membership where um, funded by physicians for physicians and of course for healthcare in general. Um, doctors of BC facilitates engagement of all different stakeholders within the healthcare um, system. In, in Canada. I'm going to step out, do some prettying up of the car as we greet our next guest. So I'll hang in there. Are you recording or can I speak inappropriately? <laughs> We're recording, but I can shut it off. <laughs> I was just okay. testing the uh, thing. I was just testing the frame and the audio. Couldn't get the microphone, so it works. We'll have to just project from the back or. I'll sit in the back and somebody It'll else work. with a quieter voice can sit in the front. Should work. So where are we going? Um, we're uh, going to a Weston? hotel downtown. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What hotel are we going to? I can feel you like it was jump? the Weston, wasn't it? Let me ask. I, I'm, sure she, I'm sure it's in the chat somewhere. If she just got on the Skytrain, we'll, we'll get there around that same. We'll we're, there uh, I'm putting us on Twitter. All right, let's do it. She's down by the Trading Convention Center, I want to say. The Convention So if we head that way, by the, she'll, she'll check in with us. That's right. Okay, so I'll just head down that way. I'll just put the Convention Center as a, tar as a destination. Um, Vancouver Convention Center? So we have two options. We could yeah. hit the highway, or we could just go down Marine and up Granville. Sometimes I'm not a big fan of straight lines and right angles. <laughs> okay, sure. So I know what you think. Sounds good. Cool. Should I shut the recording off and then record when we pick her up? Um, we could take a break for a few minutes and then turn it on again. We <laughs> could be strategic. Sure, that was... Yeah, here's here we are. We're picking up our second guest. There she is. I see her. Social media break. Wow, look at the mountains. There she is. That's her right there. Just oh. taking pictures. We see you, Jen. <laughs> Hi, I you want the front seat pro? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're the. I'm the mom. You're the pro here, so I'm. I'll be in the back seat. Okay. Hey. Lawrence is the dad. And I'm the mom. <laughs> so, <laughs> Sounds good. End of dad and end of mom. <laughs> so you've got to project, Jen, because you're back there, and, I, and my microphones wouldn't didn't work. I tried it out, and there's way too much. Oh, static. you did find them. So we have yeah. to wrap this up. Yeah. No, so you just got, yeah, you'll just have to project. Can I just, okay. Draw. You have to draw. <laughs> so Anything you want to say? You guys made good time down here. We did. Yeah. It was really Rich smooth. And what a beautiful day. Uh, look at that. Stunning, yeah. eh? So, I bet your crossing was beautiful. Where yes. Where is this um, wonderful restaurant we're going to? Oh, okay. We looked that up. We saved it in. It's not the low heat one, right? No, it starts with a B. I thought I saved this. We can look it up. White spot. North Van. Oh, it's North Van. Is it an Arban something? I don't know why. Oh, let's ask um, Claire. Brooks Bank? Yeah, yeah. it's Brooks Bank. Yeah. Okay, it's 30 minutes away. Oh, it isn't far. Okay. That was at 520. Are you 
we recording? <laughs> we are. Do you want? Should I stop? Nope. I just want. Uh, just checking. <laughs> All right. Let's say something profound. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, why are you here in Vancouver? Um, I'm here for a conference called the Family Medicine Forum. Oh. It's a big giant conference. It is. How many people do you think are coming to the Family Medicine Forum? Oh, uh, I think usually several thousand come. Wow. Oh. That's my understanding. It's your first time? No, I've been to it before, but I've never counted the people. Okay. But that's my understanding is that it's a couple thousand. Do we have like 6,000 family doctors in British Columbia? We do, yes. How many? Over, I think. Even. Oh, God. Yeah. I wonder how many nationwide. Do you have an idea? No idea. Is this a conference that moves around? Yeah. Every year? Okay. Where was it last year? Yep, you are on the fastest route. Despite exactly. some traffic, yeah. you will arrive at 5.18 p.m. Accommodate such a large conference, so it's usually in bigger cities. Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and I think it was in Quebec City one year. Okay. Are there, uh, are there patient representatives at this particular not, conference? Not to my knowledge. Do you know ah. conference? I've never been. This will be my first oh, one. Oh, really? This will be my first uh, family medicine forum. Right. Well, keep your eyes peeled. I'm curious. I I'm always curious to see what conferences we have infiltrated. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I will. So for the benefit of our listeners, we are in downtown Vancouver, <laughs> heading to the North Shore, because we're going to take this podcast to a car hop. for dinner. A car hop? Is that what it's called? It's, they're officially called car hops. <laughs> We're going old school. And so will we actually eat in the car though? They'll slide long trays. It's not like A&W where they hang the tray outside your... They actually slide, slide long trays that sit from side to side. They sit so like in your uh, window thing. Yeah. So we'll be eating on camera. Yep. <laughs> I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Be good. It'll be real. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, how you guys? How was your days? Mine was uh, mine was full of clinic and hospital, and then yeah. and then running around looking for my recording equipment, and here we are. Yeah. How was yours, Yana? My day was productive. It was a day off, and um, took my daughter to school. Canceled my thirty-minute hit membership. And um, rejigged the receipt for a laptop. Mm. That's all I'm saying. Why, why would you? Why would you cancel your 30 minute hit? Isn't that like a, a great I'm old. program? It injures me. <laughs> it's just too intense. <laughs> too much hitting. That's funny. I I recently made a similar decision to stop attending a, a circuit class that I enjoy. Really? But it leaves me in pain for three or four <laughs> days after. Okay. And so. I felt like the overall impact of my quality of life was right. not <laughs> what I was looking for. I was sad as I signed yeah. off, but yet then I remembered the um, muscle knot I got inside my left shoulder for mm. all of July. Oh. Yeah. I, I, I don't know if this is even possible, but I always tell my patients, when you exercise, don't go 10 out of 10. Go 7 out of 10. Like, that's what I say. I just feel feel cool when I say it, but I don't know if it's possible. That's really hard when there's some 20-something <laughs> yelling at you, come on, ladies! You got this! Yes. Ten more seconds! Yeah. Give it your all! <laughs> they fire you up and you hurt yourself. Yeah, pretty much. So. Okay. Which the 20-something doesn't do, but yeah. This old body. <laughs> <laughs> Give it your 7 out of 10! <laughs> hit, hit Bob! <laughs> Maybe that'll work. <laughs> that was funny. It is satisfying hitting Bob the dummy, but yeah. <laughs> I bought a Bob. I have a Bob you in my basement. You have your own Bob? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I love him. I hug him here and there. <laughs> oh, you're affectionate with Bob rather yes. than violent. My brother brings that his... that backfires. <laughs> my, my brother brings his dog over and then the dog runs at Bob, Bob and... No! <gasps> Hangs off his boob, just like bites his boob and just hangs off. Was he attacked by a bob in a past life or something? I didn't know Bob. Bob never hits back. It's weird. Jeez. 
I wonder why it gets so aggressive with Bob. I have no idea. Maybe it's what? like that uncanny valley concept where something looks like it's human, but it's not really, so it gets super creepy. Huh. Yeah, That's really interesting. You're very own Bob. Didn't know that. Mm -hmm. What a Bob is actually. Oh. It's the big dummy dude that rolls around like this. And you... Almost like a pink, pastel pink, yeah. flesh colored, flesh -colored. punching bag torso. Yeah. With no arms, but with a six head pack. and a jaw mm -hmm. and a six pack. It's got, yeah. it's got a good torso. It's kind of like Ken Barbie without legs. It's boxing shorts on. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then he's weighed down with either water or sand in a big, like, black bin. 100 pound bin on the bottom. Oh. Probably 200 just pounds. Kinda... Yeah, you hit him, he just like huh, stands like a bobblehead. Yeah. But it's nice because you don't have to wear gloves to hit him and you don't like completely injure your hands because he's made of sponge, sponges, okay. rubber. Mm -hmm. I think this is a super fancy hotel. Yeah, that's... What floor are you that's on? That's pretty cool. 21st floor. <gasps> nice. Ooh. What's your bathroom like? Fancy. <laughs> They're always fancier on the 20 and above. Are they? That's my theory. Um, Room. And I went down to check out the pool ah, deck. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Excited for that. Is it indoor? No, it's no, indoor. that's the roof one you were talking oh, about, right? Wow. The roof. And this is like this is the view okay. out oh. across the mountain. I'm gonna trust you on that. Nice. Wow. I'm coming there for lunch one day. <laughs> so you just have to walk down to the convention center for all your stuff and then go back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to hear what you guys discover and learn that this particular event. You know, this conference is, um, there's some clinical content, but there's also a fair bit of, um, how do I say, like discussions about family medicine within the bigger picture context of, um, kind of reimagining family medicine. Well, talking about, there are different sessions on different aspects of being a family doctor. Um, there's sessions on gender, there's sessions on leadership, there's sessions on uh, like social determinants of health type stuff. Right. There's quite a bit of um, teaching related content. Teaching, like how to be a better teacher. Teaching kind of and education related content. And the college has this, the College of Family Physicians of Canada has a fairly strong presence at this conference as well. Mm -hmm. um, leading sessions related to, yeah, just kind of the the core of the profession and what we do and sort of trying to continuously redefine ourselves and our role um, given how the profession and healthcare is evolving and stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that evolution of, of how family practice is going to change is related to the challenge, like the ch how, how culture has changed, right? How, how patient needs are different. Yeah. yeah. How lives are completely different because of technology as well. Yes. Um, Is there a theme for this particular? Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, I don't think so. I think there's a theme. Is there a theme? There's also, like, there's different streams as well, sort of within the conference, aside from the like, sort of clinical content. There's, also, there's the education stream, and then there's sort of research -y kind of research Oh, interesting. Okay. People who engage in research and are interested in research. The program for this conference has about 150 yeah. pages. 180 pages. 80? It's the most it's the most varied wow. conference it's I have ever seen, to be honest, on anything that I've ever been to. Wow. Yeah. There's a fair bit of stuff on Hopkins stuff. This conference actually writes on Hopkins. I did see some, but. I see Sally Lynn is giving the keynote on Saturday, actually. Oh, remind me who she is. She's the downtown East Side Portland Hotel Society oh. medical director who is spearheading quite a bit of the. Oh. Um, is she that young brunette? She's on Twitter. She's the young brunette. Yes, yeah, I remember. She's I love her. She's awesome. Yeah, so she's doing the keynote on Saturday. She like worked with Gabor about five, seven, seven years ago or so. Okay. I think. I yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Christy Sutherland. She won a big award. Work. What are your topics, Jen? 
Like, I'm that, that you're presenting on? No, I'm not presenting. Oh. No, I'm just attending. I thought I saw your name on some presentation stuff. But yeah. No, I, I remember your posts, I guess, on Facebook about it. Oh, yeah. No, I, I'm not presenting. Oh. I'm just very excited to attend. That's cool. How many have you been to now? The, the four? Oh. I think this will be my third only, actually. Mm. And they have an app. I think the conference has an app. They do have an app. Yeah. The app is using the interpretations as we speak. Excellent. The I just got one too. <laughs> CMA Health Summit had that, and it was excellent. It was a great way for, and we had yeah, a, a separate folder updated. for all the patients too, so we were all connecting that way. Great. What a beautiful day. Uh, Crossing the lines, great gate bridge. Mm -hmm. Every time I cry. Yes, Dr. Rita McCracken. She is an amazing. Yeah, so she and Brenda and a couple of other superstars are leading a Brenda Purdy and Betty Hill, Caleb, the site director for St. Paul. They're leading a session on gender and medical education leadership. Wow. I want to be there. That's it. So they're tying together. Uh, gender concepts and and leadership. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, I'll, oh, kind of like sort of see. Ha, oh, well, ha, like clinician leadership and gender. Yeah. Or I is, think it has it's not a patient for this. Um, well, well, I guess I'll find out when I go to the oh. I think it has more to do with uh, women in medicine. women who are in leadership roles within medical education. Yeah. Uh, It's so cool that people are actually talking about that stuff because, yeah. Mm. And um, I don't know if you follow Virginia and Goel, and I don't know if I said her name right on Twitter, but she's giving a session on anti oppression in medicine. Awesome. Oh, depression in. Anti oppression. Anti oppression, okay. Mm. Mm. Not that's, depression. That's very new. Not to depression, me. no. Yeah. Interesting. Mm. Mm. And her oh, name was Pratika something? Pratika. Pratika. She did a sort of viral a, a Twitter thread that went um, yeah. sort of viral when that whole Trudeau blackface thing happened. Oh. anti oppressive practice of medicine. Set theme to this podcast. Update Lawrence on goings on on Twitter. I know. Yeah, I, know right? I have no idea what's going on. Lawrence here has been banned what's from Twitter. On? So give us a update. give us a Give us a Twitter What's update it? so that the people can help yeah. bring you back, Lawrence. Yeah, I don't know. Like, so I feel like it's been two months now. At so least two months ago, I, I got, I got, I tried to get onto Twitter. September third. It was September third. I tried to get onto Twitter, and it said, "Sorry, your account has been suspended. Uh, if you'd like to make um, appeal this decision, uh, emails email us at Twitter support." So I followed the link. I emailed Twitter support. I got a reply right away on September 3rd. It said, we've received your appeal. We'll get back to you within a few business days. Sometimes it may take longer. No replies since then. So, that, so and, and you I, followed up? And I keep emailing that particular address. About two weeks ago, which was about six weeks into the suspension, I emailed them again and I said, any updates? Um, I still don't know why I've been suspended. I read through the rules of why you get suspended and I didn't violate any of them up to my knowledge. And then so I got a reply back. This case has been closed. You you will need to open a new a new appeal. <laughs> so so, you I, did? I, so I did. So that was You're doing everything right. a week and a half ago, opening that, another appeal. I had two other accounts going and those two other accounts were I created them like last year. One of them was called Healthcare Dashboard. Mm -hmm. And then the other one is called Oat Force. Oat Force is the opioid agonist therapy force. It was kind of like a community of practice around buprenorphine 
for mm. for family doctors to prescribe. So I created a Twitter account because I was thinking maybe we could gather some support and make uh, get the word out there of to, to try to get more uptake of, of using that therapy for patients who are vulnerable. So I had those two accounts and I got a notification on the healthcare dashboard account. We see that you've been creating multiple accounts to circumvent uh, suspension. That's exactly uh, what you were doing. <laughs> but, but I hadn't touched those accounts for that particular account for a whole year before. So, oh. and so I, of course I, my suspension was on September 3rd and I hadn't touched that account since last year. So it didn't really make any sense. So there's something weird going on and nobody's talking to me from for Twitter. But I know that a lot of you guys and some of you have been trying to tweet about saying, hey, bring Lawrence back or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's pissing off the Twitter yeah. people so they're, ig so they're, uh -oh. ignore so they're okay. ignoring myself. Okay, stop the campaign. <laughs> I don't Everyone know. stand down. <laughs> stand down. I have no idea. I don't know how to approach this situation. I'm just <sighs> waiting patiently and I've moved to Facebook and I'm uh, doing that Canadian Health and Care yeah. Quality Improvement Network moderation for now. And, and you started that group on Facebook? I did. Um, so that was Sounds the bad. Doctors of BC um, wanted to create a quality improvement thing and I volunteered to do it. So. And how many members supporting. in that group now? I think it's 130, 140. Awesome. Yeah, so, but not, not a lot of interaction, but... Lots of posting? A lot of posting by me. <laughs> I try to post once a day, uh, which is supposedly what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed yeah. to post more than once a day. Yeah. So I try to limit myself there. And I've been had, reading. Yeah, we've had a few uh, medical students participate, and um, the people from the Quality Council in British Columbia are participating, and we have doctors of BC staff on there, and so. But it's your account is here. You're a medic. Like, you actually. But it says suspended on it, right? It yeah. Say that. What? It says that I. It says that I don't follow you, and it says that I've been blocked from following you. So yeah, I did not block you, and and when I try to get onto the account, I can't do anything. I can't, I can't like stuff. I can't post anything. It says your account has been suspended. Yeah, uh, it's weird. I don't know. But that's interesting that it shows up that way. We need to get a Twitter expert involved in this. I actually reached out to the Doctors of BC Communications guy, and Amory Wong's his name, and, and he said, I just got to solve, solve it through Twitter. He said, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Okay, well, I think we should shout out on Twitter and see if we can find people on Twitter who know about more about how to deal with Twitter issues. I remember back in the MySpace days, there was some guy, I think his name was Tom, like he was like the MySpace uh, guru or this, the guy who started MySpace. Uh, is there a Twitter person like that? There must be. I know there's Twitter support, but Isn't there, they are not. Jack, right? Who's Jack? Jack is, is oh, Jack the guy is one of the started Twitter. Twitter. Okay, so maybe I'll Because <laughs> somebody on, in, in the campaign to bring you back, somebody tagged Jack. <laughs> Jack's probably like, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> He's causing us so much He's trouble. out for good now. <laughs> yeah. Sorry if this car smells a little bit like dog. The prior owner had their dog sleeping in it. Notice. So tell us about this car, Lawrence, because I don't think in our first episode we actually did we talk about. No, it? I don't think we did. No, you might have narrated over top, but you. I just noticed that because I was listening oh. to it a little bit today. But tell yeah. us again. <laughs> so, um, this is a 2005 Honda Accord. Um, and I think it was bought new by, by Ronda Rousey. And Ronda Rousey is, is um, a Judo Olympian. And from her time of uh, training for the 2008 Olympics in Beijing, she pretty much lived in this car, going from practice to practice across the country, going from competition to competition. Uh, she lived in this car. And she, at the same time, she was training for MMA, like mixed martial arts after that, from 2000, after her Olympics. So, 2008 to 2012, and so she used this vehicle during that time to live in and train in all across the country as well. Um, she got pretty big. She got into the UFC. She was the first female uh, into the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and and she was, has been in a few movies now, uh, some of the Fast and Furious movies, The Expendables, 
and uh, she put up this car for auction to pay for her sister's um, college tuition. And I'm a huge fan. I've done a little bit of training with her in judo um, in California, and I ended up uh, bidding on the eBay um, auction for the for this car. I didn't win. Some other dude won, but he dropped out. And then after oh, he dropped wow. out, I didn't know that part. the guy, I think, I can't remember his name, who was running the auction, who was one of one of Rhonda's employees, he he knew me from when we I'd done the training, and he's like, hey, I saw that you were, your name is on the, the auction, and I know you didn't win, but it's now available at a discounted price. So it was it was fifteen thousand dollars for it. at the time this car was valued at like five thousand. The Kelly Blue Book was like five thousand, so it was a ten thousand dollar extra thing. But to support your sister, support support your <laughs> sister's college fund, and to have a piece that you could you know I don't know Say. put in some type of weird MMA museum or something in the future. So well, I see she signed the dashboard. I didn't notice that last yeah, time. Yeah, she did. She signed the dash. Yeah, last time it was Bye, night. Fonda. It was nighttime. Why did she call it the Fonda? I don't know, because it's a Honda. I don't know. But where'd the F come from? I don't know. She's a different type of person as well, like Rhonda is. Yeah, so it says, Goodbye, Fonda. You were the best noble steed I could ask, ask for. for. You, you never... never... You go ahead. I'm not driving. Uh, so I can't... Yeah, you are driving. You never <laughs> broke down. You hung in there when I couldn't afford to change your oil. I could always depend on you. I love you. Enjoy retirement. Rhonda Rousey. <laughs> there you go. And there's lots of cool things glued throughout the car. I see it too. Yeah, there's a Dragon Ball Z characters. There's Pokemon in the corner and there's some like uh, homies, dude. homies from, base, from California baseball. Ninjas, there's medals from her grappling. Coins. There's her, her dog's uh, license tag for her dog. Bracelet. These are the, from 2008 Olympics, these are some of the mascot wow. collectibles. She left her, her cannabis, medical cannabis card was in here. Oh, her, she might need that. Yeah. A bunch of other stuff was in Yeah, it was weird. My wife was not impressed when I brought home the car, but. Yeah. Because <laughs> I told her, I'm going to do a podcast in it. And she's like, yeah, that sounds like more of a waste of money. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, shit. Not much support here. <laughs> are we on exit 23A? We are. Perfect. She's just uh, checking. So we're picking up one more person for our podcast tonight. We are. Who happens to live over here on the North Shore, where we find ourselves. Where conveniently, there's also a white spot with the car hop. Did you bring your hunger, Jennifer? Yeah, I am actually. I was hungry. <laughs> nice. I actually ate a cookie in the mini bar in the hotel room. <gasps> what? Eight dollars? No, it was. <laughs> oh, oh, it's pretty big. <laughs> They're <money>. discounted. <laughs> I know. I checked the prices. It's quite taboo for me to eat a mini bar, right? Yeah. Like, it's like a. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Who eats out of the mini bar? No. People never. who are hungry after long journey. <laughs> I know. So I, I've never done that. Wow, it's a, it's a big, new... big day for me to eat <laughs> in the mini bar. The day Dr. Ross ate out of the mini I bar. I don't normally do that. But I figure it's for the four dollars. I'll but never. I'm excited. What I, you know, I don't eat the white spot a lot, so any suggestions on menu items? Oh man, I... it's hard not to go for the burger. Yeah, they have it's great spot. legendary burgers. They do. Their pastas are good. They have ribs. They have a good veggie burger. They do. They have the Beyond Burger there. They now have the Beyond Burger. Uh huh. Are you oh, vegetarian? I can't remember. Not like no. 100%. But you prefer. They also have a gluten free bun. Their sweet not potato fries are good. <laughs> Just saying. I love your gluten. You're a gluten glutton? Uh, <laughs> I don't know if I'm a gluten glutton, but I, I live with it. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. It's a way to get one. It's really super What else is good about this one? I like, they have this, they have this toasted shrimp sandwich that I really enjoy. Um, 
the ribs are uh, always good. The chicken Caesar portion. is good there. Yeah, I always get the Caesar. They actually they have got some healthy bowls like Buddha bowls kind of thing that you can order oh. anything with them. Anything. I believe so. Uh -huh. You have milkshakes, of course. Oh yeah, in the old metal tins. All right, we're pulling up to the white spot. Is it? Want to go shopping? <laughs> I didn't know this was where it was. So that should be at the back, I would assume. This window it actually doesn't open. That's one of the. Weird things about this car, but oh. but you can still slide the tray in the side, probably. I do really think it would be cool if we were all wearing fire pack <laughs> crowns. That would be awesome. You know, my so kids don't even get crowns them. when we get fire packs anymore. No. They don't even get cr crowns. I don't know. The whole car is Yep. Oh, good. Yeah. You can close your window with oh, the tray in. in. We don't just sit here. Yeah, we totally sit here. Yeah, you, you, use, you signal with joy. your uh, you signal with your lights. Oh, I see, but I would like fresh air. I like fresh air. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah, we'll that's allow it. totally fine. Please do. I'll just let know. I'll let our next guest <laughs> know that we are we here. We have snacks too. Snacks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I've got water. We're checking out the menu. Mm -hmm. Hand scooped milkshakes, strawberry, vanilla, or chocolate. The avocado beyond nice. burger. Clam chowder or Fisher soup. Bacon cheddar bigger burger. Well, the avocado beyond burger. You can get zoo sticks, which are zucchini sticks. I had no idea that this existed. Why would people do this instead of eating in the restaurant? Because historically because we did social this. Social phobia? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, back in the day. Because grandparents? I don't know. Has everyone decided on their menu option? Oh, they've created a new word, spotitarian. Yeah, that's how I got my $5 discount. Apparently I'm a spotitarian. Mm -hmm. Good. How did you become a spotitarian? I don't know. It was kind of creepy that we were coming here and then I got this email. Here. Like they knew. Oh, they check at least not. Pomegranate vanilla flavored cashews. Yes, please. What is it? Why is being a hand scooped milkshake special? What's the what's a what's the alternative of being a hand scooped milkshake? Um, McDonald's machine processed, where it just soft serves. Whereas this must be like they literally have hard ice cream. They scoop it out. They put it in the old-fashioned milkshake better. mixer. Totally. <laughs> Has a different taste than ours. Mm. I'd like to try the avocado Beyond Burger. They have fish and chips, too. Has mm. anyone had a Beyond Burger yet? I've never had one. I have. I've had one. And? I've heard that they're... Not as good as me. <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion. Were you fooled? No. I like a veggie burger that doesn't taste like meat. <laughs> I want to know that it's a veggie burger. I need it to. I've had the bean ones from Costco and they're pretty good. Yeah, they, they are. Bean ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. It's slightly weird to have conversations without being able to see or hear each other's faces. <laughs> <laughs> so, tomorrow. Is tomorrow the first day of the conference? Yes. Or is, oh, it is. Mm -hmm. So 30th, 31st, 1st and 2nd, it's four days. Four? Mm. Close from the island's coming. Oh gosh. A lot. Oh, I don't know. Like lots, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Mm. Um, yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. Folks from our residency program. Oh, good. Like nice. Mm. There was really low awareness in my division of the family medicine forum. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. How come? I don't know. People are just so busy doing their own thing. Mm. I know that the division is going to have, Surrey North Delta Division, they're going to have a booth for recruiting physicians. They're trying to recruit more doctors to the area. So they're going to just have a table where they're hoping to recruit people. Um, you know, the family medicine forum does like directly compete with the St. Paul's Conference, which happens very Done. close at the same time. Oh. Well, it's in November, right? Oh, that's so. weird. 
Mm. I've been to the St. Paul's one once or twice. Yeah, me too. Which one's that? That's not the sport. No, that's family. Is it what is it called? Fa it's St. Called Paul's the, Family Medicine Forum. Yeah, it's, uh, family family medicine it's a different conference. format. It's just a. Well, that's interesting. Just CME. It's a like. Um, together. It's a yeah. bit, it's just a big giant room with thousands of Massive people in room, it. Massive room, no track, one track. It's just one track, and it's just like an information friends. dump basically yeah. oh. so every session the sessions are all like mm. 20 minutes long or something mm. right 30 minutes at most yeah and it's just like boom 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 um very intense here's your certificate yes so if you can actually if you're someone who can actually ingest that amount of information in that small amount of time then i think it's yeah good bang for your buck there she is. Yeah. <laughs> no way. Come on. Patients in the front, doctors in the back. I am the front. You need to plan that out. I don't know. This is a patient I, focused. Yeah. Okay. I am so not. I don't know about that. I don't know if you trust me in the front of your car. I'm not sure about that. Mine pulls a fast one. There's snacks. Oh, oh wow. Snacks That's now. okay. Thank you. I'm fine. Thank you. Okay, I'm taking snacks away from the doctor. So I turn on the headlights, and that should signal to them that we want to make okay. an order, and then they'll come out. All right. Yeah, and then, yeah. Oh, is that how it works? If it doesn't work, So I'm, I'm very excited. I've never done You've never a done white spot sit, drive, Me in. Either. Car hop, apparently, Car it's called. <laughs> <laughs> very excited. I was like, yeah. this is cool. So, we used yeah. to go to A&W. And yeah. I guess, I don't know what they if they called it a car hop, too, to A&W, but where would they put the little tray outside yeah. your window um, because oh, dismantling the yeah. um we go obviously for yeah. the root beer but also for the whistle dog does anyone remember the aw whistle dog okay no i know what you're talking about you want it it makes this high high pitch high pitch noise oh i never saw that i have no idea what you're talking about this <laughs> i is think like it was like a deep, deep fried hot dog. dog or something oh my god something like that mm. but no it did have bacon in it Anyway, I have no idea what you're talking dog, about. Yeah. But the yeah. Frost A and W glass. I'm gonna have to bring my son here, I think, because yep. uh, he, he needs would, to try this. He would love to do this. <laughs> oh, is there like a movie that rolls down? <laughs> <laughs> it's so, so cool. We just project. <laughs> this reminds me of going to a drive-in, drive right? Yeah. Are there any drive-ins that exist still in Vancouver? Langley. Langley. Oh, okay. I've been to one. Oh yeah. I mean, I'm, do triple features. Yeah, I remember going Whoa. to drive. -in. Yeah, and then you like come out like two o'clock in the morning or something. It's scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were. Yeah, because imagine in summertime. Yeah. Yeah, time you horror movie. And, yeah. That'd be pretty yeah. cool. I'm having a flashback to wearing pajamas and watching The Other Side of the Mountain with my dad. The Other Side of the Mountain, the true story of Jill Claremont, who had a skiing accident and became yeah. a pod paraplegic, quadriplegic. Oh. I can't remember. It was a huge story in my childhood. I loved it. So we went to see the movie Love with Bow Bridges. I was in my pajamas. My dad stopped to buy slime with worms. Oh. Those, the, those are the order things. That's what you order. Yeah. Oh, okay. I do think the lim the menu might be more limited than if you were in the. Oh no, that's time. fine. That's just that means I was like, okay. Mm. The hazard lights. So can we push something sounds. on the TV so we can, or on the TV? Can we, Dad, can we push something on the TV yeah. Yeah. Okay. so we can see ourselves? Yeah, yeah. So slide up, slide up through the line, slide up, yeah, and then press. Oh, there's a chappy. Right. This looks like a chap. Yeah, he's a chappy. <laughs> top right. Happy chappy. <laughs> oh, GoPro. Right? Yes, yes, that's the one. Uh, a little higher. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There we go. Hello. Fabulous. There you go, people. Now you can <laughs> test about how you look. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm like, where are we looking? There is. That's good though. It's a great set. You centered it. Well, yeah, it's well we centered. It in, in it's a wide screen and everything. Yeah. It's beautiful. Look at that sunlight. Yeah, you've done it well. You captured it really. The ambiance is fantastic. <laughs> and then we'll tell the guy, do you know you get to be on candid camera? <laughs> Yeah, well, we won't mention it. that. We won't mention that at all. <laughs> Good service this is be paramount. Right. This is, yeah, this is Canada. He might be There's like, the trees. Oh, Look at that. that. That's fantastic. I think he's good. So, what's on the plan for dinner tonight, everyone? Well, we were just looking at the menu up there. There was some talk of the avocado beyond burger I know. as, as well that, as yeah. Yeah. the hand scooped yeah. milkshake. There is some discussion of what makes it better if it's hand scooped and what would yeah. be yeah. so so But it says burger combo. What does that mean? Like with fries or salad? Yeah, salad and sweet a drink. potato, regular drink. fries, okay. Caesar, or the you... house salad. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I'm going the avo beyond burger. But I had a look. It comes with a quite a spicy sauce thing, which I'm like, oh, really? have it without the sauce. Have it on it's the like side. A, it's like a yeah, I have it on the side. Or just not. No, I will. So, yeah. 
I got a sponsor, by the way. I got a sponsor for the podcast, and they'll be taking hey. care of dinner today. What? Yeah, what? it's called the Health Canadian Health Information. Oh, Chin. Something. <laughs> it's not chin. network. So that means we do have make to make up say an acronym. No, I, I, I'll, I'll add it on the end. But no. no. <laughs> what? No. It's a, a personal friend of mine. Okay. That's just that. Yeah. So thanks to the Canadian Health Absolutely. Awareness Society, Canadian Chas, Canadian Health Awareness Society. Okay. Well, that's very awesome. Wow. Mm, yeah. Thanks, Chas, thanks for, for dinner. dinner. Absolutely. Mm. That's great. Mm. We'll have some very stimulating health yeah. awareness. And <laughs> we're getting a bottle <laughs> of Chardonnay Chardonnay with us now. <laughs> I don't know if they have Chardonnay at White Spot. <laughs> <laughs> Should I have one of the best chickpea <laughs> curries? Just out of interest. Can't scoop milkshakes for everyone. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure they might take how many drinks you've yeah. had. Yeah. She's That's driving. She can't have. Yeah, I yeah. noticed there's no no liquor menu. Yeah, that's probably on purpose. I'm sure. <laughs> you drive in, just get. Okay, I I I, I don't know how to. Uh, we're ordering through your window. I think. Whichever. Yeah. Well, Except the oh, well, there's locked us in. Yeah, I can't that's press the, it down. That's not the window button. That's why it didn't work. Um. Do we need to? Okay. Thanks. Turn the key so that we can get. Yeah. The that's that's down. There. Oh, oh, there. There we go. But his, it, okay, we'll probably switch that off. My goodness, I hit it. He knows we're here now. <laughs> oh, it doesn't go further? Oh, there's a child protection. What? Yeah. We can always, now that these are down, we can slide the trays in from the front window to problem Who's coming to your side? Oh, he's coming to your side. Rest on. Just there you go. Hi there. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. 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 It just comes with the triple oil sauce. Yeah. Do you want lettuce? Um, sure. So cheese, lettuce, sure. And sweet potato fries? Yeah. And gluten free bun, please. Mm-hmm. Is it an allergy or preference? Just preference. Yeah. Sure. And anything to drink today? Um, no, I think I'm good. Even on water? <laughs> um, sure. I maybe get pressured by my friends into getting milkshake at some point, apparently, but. All right. <laughs> well. Um, can I please have the avocado Beyond Burger sure. on a gluten free bun? And preference. Thank you. Um, can I have the, I think it's got a, a sauce. Can I have that? No, no sauce. Oh, yeah, it's no like sauce. hummus is quite spicy, I think. Sure. Thank you. That sounds lovely. And anything on the side today? No, thanks. Sure. And, and some water. Water well. Thank you. Sounds good. And in the back seat? I'd like to try the avocado burger, but I don't know about the sauce. It looks, it sounds nice. I think it's like, what is it? Spicy tahini yeah, it's, and it's a, something? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind on of the a side. mildly spicy sauce. I'll try it. Yeah, I'm sure it's lovely. I'm just and not like so the chocolate milkshake. Chocolate milkshake? Oh. And anything on the side? The fries or just the burger and the Just the burger and the shake. I'll have a legendary burger. Yeah. And I'll also have a toasted shrimp sandwich. Sure. What type of bread would you like? Rye. We have multi grain white or sourdough. 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 Anything on the side with either of those? Nope. And is there any toppings on your burger? Tomato, cheese, onions, mushrooms, all of the above. Everything. Oh. Yes. Was that raw onions or sauteed onions? Raw. Oh, oh my. Oh, Enjoy that, that, guys. Oh, Enjoy that. that was great. Right. Thanks, Lawrence. From raw onions, cheese, lettuce, tomato, bacon, <laughs> uh, and mushrooms. Yes. Good. Just to let you know, cheese, bacon, and mushrooms is an upcharge. Sure. Already. Thanks, is there anything else you can put on? We're sponsored. Is there anything else you can put on it? I'll have, I'll have, a, I'll have a, a water. Olive <laughs> and water. Nobody else is getting milkshakes. I did. I got a milkshake. Which one? Yeah. Which one? Yeah. I'll have a strawberry milkshake, strawberry. small, as well, along with the water. Yeah. yeah. Alrighty. Um, we're kind of about a fifteen-minute wait today. Okay. So I'll see you guys in a bit. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Wait, when does that? At uh, ooh water. Okay, hang on. You can keep yours up. Yeah, For yeah. now, I'm putting mine up. Oh, it's nice to have some fresh air. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, thank you, Chili. Sure, too. So, why don't you introduce yourself, Blair? The rest yes. of us have kind of done so. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, um, my name is Claire Sneeman. Um, I am. I was trying to think about this other day. What am I? And I'm like, hmm. <laughs> it's like this is a good question. You're a human. I am. I am human. This is good. Although my son probably begs to differ sometimes. <laughs> you are, are you, mom? <laughs> um, I am. I would call myself a healthcare advocate. Mm. And in my mind, I see that as somebody who is passionate about looking at ways to contribute towards providing better healthcare 
um, as someone who has been involved in the healthcare system as a patient, um, I think through my lived experience, I can bring sort of a patient voice to the table. So I'm always mm -hmm. looking for ways to collaborate with healthcare providers, with other patients to really use my experience in the past, but also now to do so. So mm -hmm. I do that in various different ways. So yeah, that's, well, that's me. We're so happy to have you here with yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. And <laughs> we, we typically say what's off limits. So we try to keep our family members out of yep. our mm -hmm. podcast. We don't, we don't mention names of family members yep. or, um, locations where we live uh, okay let's like pick me up <laughs> is there any anything else that's off limits uh, that, that you wouldn't want to talk about your health well, conditions etc or we're not going to talk about our patients yeah we won't talk about so yeah. dr ross and i won't talk about our patients so. correct have uh, the rest of us actually introduced ourselves no. it's not too not necessary. No, okay we didn't. should probably do so too you talked about your conference, oh, that's right. but yeah, yeah I don't think technically we have. So, yeah, was there anything that's off limits? Um, no. If there is, just don't answer. Yep. Say next question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. Yeah, okay. we're pretty good advocates. All right. Yeah. Awesome. So, I actually introduced myself earlier, but I'll do it again. So, I'm a family doctor in Surrey, and <laughs> I bought this car and. To justify it, I'm doing a podcast in this car. Um, <laughs> oh, the truth is a podcast, even though it's video. Is a it video podcast. Same? Yeah, okay. and it'll be. I found a, a SFU student who's been doing the cataloging of watches it and says, at this time, you guys talk about this. And awesome. then they'll put it onto the YouTube thing so you can click and uh, get right to that particular yeah, that's subject. Cool. That's, that's cool. great. Um, yeah, uh, I'm really interested in um, how. Oh in getting, capturing voices and putting voices together. This podcast is called FTS, which stands for Fuck the Silos, which is pretty much like- <laughs> I didn't awesome. know that's what it stood for. FTS yeah. and the Fonda. Make sure that all, yeah. we're, we're all living in different silos and we all yeah. know what needs to happen, but we're not really joining forces to make it happen. So it's exciting to have patients and physicians together in, in this podcast, because mm -hmm. we are really trying to get rid of some of those silos and talk about the things that matter. Mm -hmm. uh, so Except that's- it. Both of the physicians are in the back seat, and both of the patients, patients, patients are in the front seat. That's right. The, the patients are driving the car. By going in the back seat. No, he and he took down there. the headrest. This is, okay, this all right. Is, it's it's <laughs> metaphorical. I'll give you that. For what we're trying to do in the healthcare system. <laughs> it's our job to give you a hard time. <laughs> do you want to go next, Jennifer? Uh, sure, Jen Ross. I'm a family doctor in Victoria, and... How did I end up here? Is it Twitter? Is it Twitter based? Well, I met you at Quality Academy last that's right. year. Mm -hmm. um, so we took a quality improvement yeah, course together. That's awesome. together. And then through Twitter, ended up following you guys. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, what I have, um, I think what drew me in was just that I'm really drawn to anyone who things as deeply about the doctor patient interaction as I do and so I'm here mainly to be around other people uh, who think about these things and talk about them so yeah awesome. Awesome. yeah and it's so cool that you're in town and yeah, um, yeah I'm here for a conference and so yeah. that worked out and you guys gratefully I'm grateful that you, made you just me. arrived on a boat this this I afternoon did, I, did, yes. <laughs> so. I know what I paid just 13 bucks to go into the Sea West Lounge Ooh. Yeah. Do you know what that is? No. I guess yeah. it's a lounge. It's a on the child ferry. free space on the ferry. <laughs> no <laughs> screaming. Which is important because so, it can be noisy. Yes. No, oh, that's awesome. I'm not nothing against children. I have some of my own. <laughs> that's why you went to the child free lounge. <laughs> what are some of the amenities in that lounge I've never experienced? It's quiet. Uh, there's like free snacks. Co oh. Free coffee, tea, and snacks. Oh, okay. Is it also, does it, is it double as the Pacific Buffet in no. the morning? It's a different space? It's a different space. I don't know where this is on the ferry. I must find this next time. It's like much smaller. It's right at the one end of the boat. Okay. And, um, on the yeah. highest level, and it's just quiet. Oh. You're not, you're actually not allowed to use your cell phone in the CBS lounge. The guy oh. tells you that as you go in. Whoa. Oh. Oh. I feel like, I feel like you're hunting this down. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know oh, about gosh. the not use my cell phone part. But. Well, I mean, you're allowed to <laughs> you can't talk like, about it. Yeah. You're not allowed to have cell phone conversations oh, okay. in the CUS lounge. You can text. They That's quite useful. Yeah. yeah. Step out. They don't take them have a basket and you put your phone in as you go in. <laughs> <laughs> a lockbox. No. Yeah. no, no. 
Wow. Yeah. So we have planes, trains, and autom- automobiles for us today yeah. on this podcast. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Got on the ferry, then I got on the bus, then I got on the sky train. You did the most modes of transport yeah. today out of us. And now you're living in a building with sails on it. I know. Mm-hmm. That's cool. And a rooftop pool. I'm in That's a right. hotel fancier than I've been in before, I would say. Yeah. That's good. Do you need more room? You want me to move the seat? Oh, yeah. I'm good. Okay. You good? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Just kick me. I think it's, it's your turn it's to my introduce now. Ooh. Rusty on the intro. Um, my name is Jana Bjelman. I guess I identify as a patient and a caregiver advocate. Um, probably a similar intro to what I said in our first podcast um, in that I identify as a caregiver advocate. And I think that's really brought my voice forward in relation to my husband's assisted death. Um, really started to speak out about our experience through Dying with Dignity Canada and otherwise and then realized that it actually connected me on a larger level to my experience um, with having an autoimmune disease, obviously a very overt one, living with alopecia, and that's something I've spoken about and been on the board of the national organization. And so I think those things all kind of converge into my larger um, perspective um, and really identify with the concept of N of one, that relationship between patient and physician. So a shout out to Cancergate, to to Andy DeLeo, um, down in the U.S., and I think that's what I'm really excited about today, and that we've doubled our N of 1. We've got two patients and two doctors, and, and I'm really excited to see where our conversation goes while eating. <laughs> yes, this could be troublesome. Isn't that an N of 4? N of 4? <laughs> yeah, you might need to get a bigger car. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get a car where the seats rotate. And and space yeah. Uh, uh, like cool. Lounge car. <laughs> it's like a... A camper, right? Well, yeah. I, had, I had floated the uh, floated the uh, hot tub idea, but <laughs> we didn't end up going with that. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Should, Ross wanted us to do the podcast from the hot tub. We should still do that. I'm down. I'm down. <laughs> I brought a change in the trunk. As I said, we, I think that could have been very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I come from a profession where many of us um, do not hot tub or dance with one another because it's really traumatic. So as soon as you said that, I had a professional <laughs> professional trigger. Why oh, traumatic? You're not allowed to dance with each other? Well, archivists, when archivists dance, oh, it's yeah. really traumatic. <laughs> I find <laughs> bad things happen when archivists dance or I hot don't tub. actually know any other archivists. Uh, yeah, we're, you're a rare breed. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. We're, like, uh, there many no, we're just unusual. Oh, you're a rare breed. Um, yeah. Okay, well, so. no, archivists are a rare breed. I could be a rare breed too, but yeah. <laughs> so, so. <laughs> so yeah, we're safely in the confines of a car, not a. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. I say. Yeah. Next I time. <laughs> scare people away Ooh. from this, this podcast. You yeah. have to go in a hot tub if you want to be on this podcast. Like, what? <laughs> you might get the wrong type of people coming to the podcast. <laughs> <I'm thinking. laughs> but, don't know. So, have you been on a podcast before, Claire? Yes. Yeah, and I've done a couple. Please don't ask me what they were because with my memory challenges, I'd be like, Oh. You were on Patient Critical Co-op podcast. Yes. Thank I just you. Got with, asked PJ. To do the next one. with PJ. Oh, yeah. he's fantastic. Yeah, he's amazing. Mm. PJ, great uh, community that he's brought together with Patient Critical Co-op. Yeah. So, yeah, and that was actually a great one. There were a couple of us on that. It was really one. a great one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I've done quite a few uh, podcasts. I actually enjoy doing podcasts because yeah. it's just casual conversation and it just you just go with the flow and see where it happens mm. to land up. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, mm. thank you for reminding me because I'll be going, hmm, <laughs> and scratching Maggie, that archived. Maggie, yes, Maggie was now? on it. Um, and Robin. Robin McGee. Right. And uh, Rachel. Oh, from Calgary. Yes. Yes. Okay. So there were I'm four of us that. and, of course, PJ. So it was really great. That's, That's great. Really well, he's asked me to do the next <clears throat> patient roundup one, so I'm not sure That's who's awesome. with me, but I'm looking That'd forward be great. to it. Oh, yeah. I can't wait to hear that. So how do you do it? Do you all just call in yeah. or mm-hmm. something like yep. that? Yep. Yeah, we all okay. just call in mm-hmm. and um, and get chatting. And that was a, yeah, yeah we could have carried on, on that one. That was and it was a little more structured, right? And then he gave you questions and you each took your turn and then had a chance to respond afterwards. Yeah, too. I mean, the and as far as I remember, but as I said, delving back sometimes, I'm like, mm. um, we didn't have the questions up front, but he was yeah. like, oh, okay, here's the yeah. question. And um, 
Um, what do you think, Claire? How do you find this? And then, you know, and then Maggie, how do you find this in your role as a caregiver? And da, da, da. And then he'd pose a different question. Yeah. And because sometimes in a podcast, otherwise, especially if you're not seeing people, you can't take those cues. Yes, <laughs> like, yeah. oh, everyone jumps yeah. on the line at the same time. Yeah. So he's very, very good with how he is able to structure a podcast and get sort of the whole in, uh, input from everybody on the line in a constructive manner. When so. it's just audio, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's so yeah. different. So, yeah, he's really good in that way. Yeah. So what, where, where is PJ from? What's this organization that he's from? Patient Critical Co-op mm-hmm. is literally that, mm-hmm. is, is a patient co-op. Um, mm-hmm. And PJ is based in um, Winnipeg, correct? Oh. I want to say, so I met Toronto at CMA. But, PJ, yeah. bad one on us. Hopefully you can just cut yeah. this part out. Yeah. <laughs> Be like, mm, where are you, PJ? Yeah, where are you? PJ. Where is PJ? Um, yeah, he's out there. <laughs> there, I'm like, which way are we pointing? Um, but basically, what he did is he wanted to create a patient owned cooperative mm. where uh, he could amplify and bring the patient voice forward. And um, yeah, so he created Patient Critical Co op. And he's really, he's really great. He's at, you know, he's always um, at the right meetings, the right place, but bring the patient voice forward mm. and the caregiver voice and family voice forward at mm. the right time, the right place, with the right message and questions. I always mm. like, it's the questions that he poses mm-hmm. that are really, really good. So mm. I think that's important. And a phenomenal yeah. voice on Twitter and having watched him at the CMA, incredible at yep. condensing yep. what he's hearing in yep. presentations and tweeting yep. it. Yep. Really, really good yep. at that. Um, it also has a, um, a patient and caregiver like, database where you can yes, self-identify, a lot of resources put your bio in there yep. so that if you're looking for a speaker yep. on a particular topic yep. or someone to represent, mm-hmm. um, there there's a patient mm-hmm. database. And they've got lots of good resources as yeah. well and things like that. And he's working on updating the resources. And, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Great, and so he's one respect. of a couple of, of patient-based sort of organizations mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. Canada. Yeah, because there's a patient... Um, Oh, yeah. Does the patient, patient network? Network, thank you. Does the patient voices network link in with uh, BJ's thing? No, I don't believe so. No, so. patient no. voices network is uh, more like for, for that's specific to like BC, to mm. British Columbia. And through the BC quality? And, uh, yeah, and that's all linked like where, um, as far as I'm aware, where, for example, the BC uh, Ministry of Health wanted to find a way to uh, where people like, we'd love to have a patient helping us out here and a patient voice mm. here or a caregiver voice, how do we do it? That that gets fed up to there and then that gets fed out to people who belong to patient voices network so they can apply mm. to help Are someone on a quality co- yeah patient voices to, network yeah. and then you have some of the health authorities as well like vancouver coastal health mm. has their own uh thing called uh keen which is community engagement um network similar thing where people can also apply for vancouver coastal mm. health specific okay. but they all feed in as well so for example when you get a keen newsletter, it shows you the Patient Voices Network um, okay. opportunities and vice versa. Oh, great. So it's really good that they have those opportunities for patients mm-hmm. to be part of, for example, quality councils or um, uh, whether there's something happening in primary care where they'd like to have a patient or a caregiver on a board or a committee. So, yeah. What have you done so far with Patient Voices Network? Um, I do reviewing for the uh, educational materials that go out through Vancouver okay. Coastal Health. That uh, reminds me, I've got another one to do. So any of the materials that go out, uh, basically, sort of like if you're going for surgery or whatever, and you get handed a pamphlet or anything, it goes through a couple of patients. There's, I think, three or four of us. So all the educational materials will come through to be reviewed by a patient, which I think is actually great. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes you read it and you're like, well, that's like Greek to me. Mm-hmm. And so we'll give our comments and feedback on anything from... Um, surgical to let's say uh, medication some medication reviews um, and we'll give feedback on that um, I did do I was on an advisory committee as well um, which was fantastic but I actually had to pull back on that because I think one of the things as a patient or healthcare advocate is balancing out your capacity mm-hmm. and your ability I work part-time I'm obviously a wife and a mother but given my health challenges, sometimes um, you have to be mindful of that. And this particular committee was very, it was challenging for me brain-wise. And so I felt I wasn't contributing in the way that 
they needed a patient to be contributing because I feel a patient voice is very powerful and can really add a lot. So I, I was very honest and I said, I don't feel I'm able to bring what you need to the table. Um, and mm. it's, it's not, uh, it's of a negative impact to me at this point mm. in where I am. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, but, um, there's, there's often things where you don't have to be on a committee. They just ask mm. for feedback on a poster, yeah. anybody. Super there. dynamic. Mm -hmm. I've done, I, exactly. I was shortlisted for, um, we're now going to have provincially a made advisory committee, okay. oversight committee, pardon me. Yeah. Um, and so that will have a patient component. I think it's two or three people. So I shortlisted and didn't make it. And sort of a similar situation in terms of assessing, can I actually put in what I think I this needs and, I and what I'm able to give. So in some ways I was kind mm -hmm. of thankful, but mm -hmm. I gave a one-off point of feedback um, to the New West Hospice Society mm -hmm. on a grant proposal. So contributed um, my perspective to that, but then I've also been involved with um, training new nursing staff at um, through Providence Health at St. Paul's awesome. Hospital, and that's been a fabulous mm. experience. Yeah, so big room full of nurses yeah. and uh, and and really really and mm. they she, they do a really interesting um, exercise. So the patient has spoken and given their story, and then they hand out sticky notes to everyone, and they tell them list your five most critical things if you were a patient and in a hospital bed. What were the most five important things you'd need to have? And then you pass your sticky note to the nurse beside you and then you're asked, that nurse is asked the question, you can only do three things, what are you gonna do? Mm -hmm. And the interesting point of the exercise is that wow. even after the patient has spoken mm -hmm. about their experience, um, none of the nurses turned to the nurse patient and asked them what they should remove. Mm -hmm. They all made the decision themselves oh, as to what they, they should remove. Yeah. So then that was talked about at the end yeah. in terms of, well, you had the person beside you that you could have checked us? back with right. them as to what, yeah. if you had to knock two off, what it would it be? Which would it be? So it's really neat to watch the energy of uh -huh. that experience. Uh -huh. so, yeah. That sounds like a very rewarding uh, rewarding yeah, thing to be I've involved in. Really, enjoy, Even just for the practice yeah. of speaking to a large group totally. about something very personal. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. So, yeah. Totally. Yeah. What are some of the things that you actually do in the training, aside from that? Like, do you, do you actually have a chance to speak to some of your wishes about healthcare or some of the, your wishes, how things you know, potentially um, can improve? They have their pillars um, within Providence in terms of their, their patient experience. And so they ask you mm -hmm. to bring the pillars in and I completely forgot about that when I wrote my presentation and mm -hmm. I read my presentation because I'm more comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of torqued that a little bit in terms of just asking them to be aware of the pillars, but it's pretty free form in terms of what, mm -hmm. what you're able to talk about. So I talk about particular experiences, but then I try to highlight, um, you know, what, what feels most vulnerable to me and, and, um, the value of those experiences in terms of what I now expect afterwards from mm -hmm. my engagement with mm -hmm. healthcare and with practitioners. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I get to be, it's pretty, I, I think, yeah, you, you, I'm sure you'd agree with this, Claire, when you're up at the front of that room, like the, not the pressure, but the weight of mm. knowing what you say um, is going to have impact potentially to another patient, right? Because you're, mm -hmm. you're speaking to a provider. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, um, you kind of, I don't know, and, rise up a little bit mm -hmm. um, in terms of feeling that um, yeah that you wanted to have weight but it does get carried mm -hmm. forward so yeah not it, pulling punches for no, sure no yeah it's uh it's interesting when you say that because you uh, as a patient um, I'm trying to think who it was was uh, somebody was saying why did it actually oh it was, it was actually Robin McGee I don't know if you just listened to the latest podcast because it's pa uh, patient safety week this week right oh. yeah. Um, and there's a fantastic podcast uh, done by CPSI, the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Um, and Robin is talking about it in there. And she says, why does she do what she does when, you know, she's been through so much with her illness? And she's like, well, because I want what I do, what the suffering that I've been through to have some meaning. And I was like, wow, mm. that's bang on. Yeah. I think most of us as patients or caregiver advocates do what we do because we want whatever experience it is, whatever, to have some meaning. And I think what you're saying is when you're standing up front and they're talking to care providers mm -hmm. or whatever, you want what you've been through to have some meaning. And it was interesting. I was talking at um, a leaders conference for one of the healthcare authorities and <clears throat> going through, I was talking on joy at work because such mm -hmm. an important topic, right? Especially mm -hmm. for our healthcare providers yeah. to have joy at work because we know burnout is happening and this it's on the increase and that affects us as patients, right? Our patient experience, our care, quality of care. 
And after I'd done this and there were like 400 people in the room and chatting to them and speaking to them about my experience and how when there's people who are joy, having joy at work, it impacts me. But on the way home, I really felt like, wow, I felt quite, my heart was like sore. Mm-hmm. Because when you are retelling your patient or your lived experience or what you went through, it you can feel it and it feels deep yeah. sometimes. But it was interesting because I felt, you know, that's okay. Because if that has an impact to the people who were there in the room, that it can impact them and know that it's important for them to have joy in their work and it's okay for them to take their lunch break because that's really important to me as a patient because then I know my quality of care is going to be better, mm-hmm. then that's okay. Mm-hmm. I think that, that that part of supporting patients and caregivers and telling their stories is really key because yeah. we often forget that it's not just patients getting up there and going, oh, I'll tell you my story. It's that reliving and just... Yeah. We have to be really mindful of that. Mm-hmm. Julie yes, Drury yes. talked about that after yes. this her CMA yes. presentation. So there was a bit of dialogue on Twitter in, in terms of um, your self-awareness and the time yeah. you take afterwards because you have told, yeah. spoken of your trauma and your very personal experience, but yeah. also asking, she was really brilliant in asking others to be aware of that, like be aware that when I leave that stage, yeah. um, you know, yeah. I, I, there's been an impact. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. taken me back and I do what I do for a reason, but it takes me back sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, so I think most you know, this is it, people do it because they want it to have meaning. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, yeah, um, I have to like less than that, but I'm curious to, to know. Um, okay. I've had I've been in some conversations where the subject of paying patient mm-hmm. compensation comes yep. up, and I no one can really come to any kind of conclusions on yep. whether or not that's yeah. Is that good? Is it not good? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> I have my thoughts. I totally have my thoughts. Share them. Oh, absolutely. Go for it, I've, I've been talking a lot. You go first. <laughs> Ooh, I'm not. I haven't actually spoken up about this because I feel like I'm a little bit new, still a little bit green, and just I'm really observing other people's perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, so, hmm, what do I really think? Yeah. Um, well, I totally agree that the end state is yes. Like, I mean, if it, um, you know, if we're participating, mm-hmm. if someone else is being paid to speak mm-hmm. um, for their professional context, mm-hmm. then as advocates, um, I don't think it should be any different. So, I think it's an end state. But that oh. said, I think I see sort of a process to it. Oh, hang on. Pause that. Open We've got a tray coming. Uh, yes, thank you. We have incoming food. We have to leave the. Should just go right before the window. Before the window, so you can actually, we can still actually close the window. Yeah. Right? Oh. Okay. It is a bit cold, so. Very cool. <laughs> um, would you like anything else while I'm here? Yes. Yes. No, this looks tremendous. Thank you. Okay, be right back. Thank you. So, thank okay, you. now. We, this window doesn't open, so we'll need to come from that side. No problem at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, are we putting the windows up? Sure. Okay, let's check it. Oh. Wow, that yeah, makes sense, that right? Because it's snowing outside and we're really healthy. Winter, That's brilliant. Brilliant. So much better than that. That is so right. cool. Bravo, uh, waste spot. Wow. <laughs> that looks cool. <laughs> wow. Very tremendous. So hopefully there's not um, like lots of food left over in your car. <laughs> I try not to spill it. Wouldn't be the first time. I've got the ketchup. That, you've got the ketchup. Mm-hmm. Plastic and plastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having an environmental moment up here. I've got the <laughs> I've got the salt, pepper, vinegar happening. Straws. <clears throat> We've got a little coleslaw activity. Coleslaw. Yeah. It wasn't that what? Well, uh, actually, oh, that's, that's a white it. spot memory. I think they're quite famous for their coleslaw. Okay. When I first moved to Vancouver, the first meal I had was white spot. And I, Ooh, I is that right? Really remember the cold spot. Is there a white spot yeah, in Saskatchewan? No. It's only a BC thing. Is it really? Yeah, I, I don't know that. I think we better do that. I'm starting to steam up the car. Yeah. yeah. Where did you do that. again? Montreal. Montreal. Oh, Montreal. Are you BC? Okay, Lawrence, you BC? Yeah, BC. Surrey. Surrey. Surrey, Hogan, Bray. Oh, wow. There we go. Okay. There's the Beyond Burger. Wow. It's a bit of a... It's a presence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't mind them. They're not too bad, actually. Okay. Um, oh, yes. So. Not when you pick up again? Yeah, go for it. Um, oh, yeah, maybe not. Oh. 
<laughs> yeah, I train over to you people. Up in here. I see hashtag I see milkshakes. Oh yeah. <laughs> hashtag the smaller one is oh, Lawrence's. Yeah. Look okay. at okay. okay. different okay. size milkshakes. Yeah, he got the small oh, one. Okay. Yeah, we're really fucking oh, up with this. Let me see what's going on in here. So we actually see. That's what happens as you get older. I have to like look at things from a distance. So, like, mm -hmm. not that my yeah. my, my, my uh, progressives. Oh, oh my god. Yeah. Okay. It's not fair. Paper straw. I know. Cool. No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. No, they. I think they. 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 they, they, they pickled onions. Wow. Well, born up a tree, everyone. Impressive. What did you just say? Born up a tree. Born up a tree. Yes. <laughs> I like that. Born one of my friends. Tree. I get it. One of my friends used to say that when I was like at school. Born up a tree. <laughs> so a it's born up a tree. Stuck. Where did you go to school, Claire? Um, which I went country? to school in yeah. Which country? I'm like you don't want to know where. I mean that'd be irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> I went. I was born in South Africa, <clears> so I went to school in Johannesburg, and then. We moved to Australia um, about I don't know, 17 years ago. I lived in Sydney. Mm. And then we moved here 13 years ago. Yeah. Okay. So I've been around the world. Yeah, you've been a few places. Yeah. How come you How did you end up in here? Like, why? Did My husband's happen? job, he oh. came here. So, um, uh, yeah. So, yeah, been around the world. That's pretty amazing. Yeah, it was good. I like living in different countries. It's uh, <clears throat> it's good to. Oopsie! Wow, don't push down too hard. I know, right? I had a sense of that. It's good to, and I, it's interesting because I've experienced different healthcare systems. Yeah. As mm -hmm. a result, um, which is I think always interesting because you just get to see different things and experience different things. And ours is the best, right? <laughs> Go for they it. They all have no. They mm -hmm. all have different yeah. assets and um, I, re I really appreciate the fact that the Canadian healthcare system is um, like a socialized healthcare system that is public and aims to provide healthcare to everybody. I, I truly appreciate that. I think that that is, that is great. Um, I think healthcare is a challenge for whatever country you're trying to deliver it in. I don't think there's any model around the world that is 100% um, mm -hmm. solid. I don't think that's possible because it's such a dynamic and complex system to mm -hmm. provide it in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I've, I've had healthcare in very public system obviously here. I've had healthcare in Australia and South Africa, both public and private. So I've had yeah a mix of everything really, to be honest, so all over the place. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna take a bite of my burger. So yes, someone please. else has to eat. <laughs> I'll chew my sweet potato fry and then I'll finish my comment. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, obviously, I generally agree with the comp the idea of compensation. Oh, yeah. I'm really curious about process in terms of. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if I could speak to it particularly, specifically, um, we were even just talking about the conference um, that both of you are going to that over the next couple of days, right? The family mm -hmm. practice conference um, and I was just asking if there was patient representation at it when Jen wasn't sure so I'm really curious about that so I think the idea of both patient involvement in conferences as yep. well as compensation is yep. a really interesting conversation mm -hmm. and when I attended the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Provisors in June they're just still really a very small grassroots organization yeah. so I think I kind of broke the seal on patient participation just yeah. attendance yeah. at that event yeah. And so I think even knocking on the door of, of compensation would be, uh, you know, that's, that's far down the road. Yeah. It's definitely a process, yeah. but I think that's that's the ultimate yeah. goal. Yeah. There is, um, I mean, I think the, the one thing is, there's two, well, there's, as you're saying, there's like two conversations. The one is if you're bringing in a patient or caregiver, and I mean, if the patient, it's mm -hmm. like family, caregiver, anyone involved mm -hmm. in that bucket there. If you're bringing in a patient to uh, a conversation uh, in any way that needs that would be required, or you're having that discussion about compensation, um, uh, my view is that they should be compensated because of uh, their, their voices of importance and how can you compensate that? It's, it's important to address it. Then you need to look at how do you compensate them. 
I think that's always the question is how. Well, uh, if somebody's being paid at a conference to speak, then the same should apply to the patient. Um, if it's around a table at a, uh, at a healthcare authority and other people being paid to be at that table, if that's available, then the patient can be paid. There's other ways that you can compensate people. It doesn't just have to be payment. It can be um, uh, paying for their uh, attendance at a conference. It could be transportation. There's all, exactly. There's all different things. There's all different ways that you can compensate patients. There's actually some fantastic work that was done. There's a whole paper that was published in the, um, the patient, journal, patient Experience Journal that came out that was published actually by four I don't, even know. Yeah, I don't I'll, even know there's a patient experience. I'll, I'll send it to you. Is, is that, that Isabel Jordan? Yes, Isabel Jordan. Um, and I will send that. To, I'll send you yeah. that link. But that really nailed it. And it was by Zell Press. And I always forget mm. and my name. is going like, mm. um, But that really was great in sort of articulating sort of should patients be compensated? How can you compensate them and so forth? Because I think when mm. you don't compensate patients, what you do is you decrease the validity of their voice and their contributions. So hmm. I'm a firm believer in yes, you should compensate them and that organizations should look at how they can contribute that and, and work it into their budgets accordingly. So And Isabel Jordan is a really strong voice on that in that area yeah. of patient compensation. Yeah. And things like patients included, what you're talking about with conferences, mm -hmm. that's a whole movement now that is working mm -hmm. towards and the bigger conferences, so many of them are now all patients included conferences where they have certain criteria that they have to fulfill in order for patients to be a patients included conference. Things like, as you say, um, they sponsor a certain amount of patients to come, they pay for their travel expenses, etc. up front. They have live streaming available for people who can't there. They make sure disability uh, requirements are done. So for example, a Canadian Medical Association's Health Summit. Mm -hmm. The first one wasn't patient secluded, and then um, I was on the advisory committee for the second one, and we worked towards doing that because it was a real priority for them to make sure that they became patient secluded, mm. um, which I think is important because really if everybody cool. else in the healthcare system can go to health conferences, but it's often a barrier financially. I know you look at the cost, you know. Well, I'm a patient, perhaps I'm on disability, but I would really like to go and be involved in the conversation. Well, how can you do it? So if you're able to apply for sponsorship, it makes it so much easier, right? Yeah. So. And I think, too, because the patient voice is rounding out, you know, is contributing yep. so yeah. critically to a larger uh -huh. conversation, um, right? And I, and I just think, listening to you talk, to Clara, I would think, too, that there would obviously be a benefit for practitioners in oh, terms yeah. of the consciousness raising mm -hmm. by bringing patients in and looking at the issues around um patients included, I would think that that would have an impact yep. on practitioners as well mm -hmm. in terms of like, issues around accessibility and you know, having children at conferences and mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, I, I think, yeah. I, I was just going to say, I think just generally, um, there's, there's only certain people in society who can afford to volunteer their time. Yeah. And so you, you definitely limit your pool of representation um, if you're expecting people to volunteer their time. I, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more on that because uh, it's volunteering, but then it's also, for example, patients included is a good example. If you're going to a conference, but sometimes you might get paid, you might go to a conference, so even if they don't reimburse you up front, just having to pay to go to the conference is sometimes mm -hmm. out of reach for many people. Because you're like, oh, I have to expense it, but then I can only claim it and it takes me two months to get back that credit card, that flight, so that's just not an option for me, I can't do that. So people have to take that into account when they're planning with patients or anybody that, you know, uh, we need to make this as accessible as possible. For people um, and at the same time if you are working with patients in your network to be aware that this group of individuals um, may have different uh, things that they're dealing with in their life just to be aware of that they may have chronic conditions and they may have times where they I can't make that meeting today I'm really not feeling well and they are at a, a more let's say at risk group than the general working population and I find that myself is that that is just something to be aware of and it's not just like oh gosh that that's that is a very important thing to be aware of and to support patients in that 
uh, mm. role that they're taking on, but to be aware of the fact that they are patients yeah. and these are caregivers. A caregiver may have to be, I'm really sorry, but I have to take my loved one to an appointment and I can't actually get out of it. So I yeah. can't contribute to the meeting today. So, Do you know yeah. if anybody has written or talked about, I'm really now thinking about this, mm-hmm. the, the, um, by elevating the, our consciousness in that regard, talking about things seems in relation to patients, has it had a, a domino effect or like a roll off into practitioners? And the same not. the same sorts of issues. I think that would be really interesting uh, to look at. Does would, it? Would do you do you feel as practitioners that it opens a door to um, similar conversations for you in terms of um, affordability, accessibility, mm-hmm. um, your own personal health? Um, you know, if, if we're talking about these things from a personal level as patients, does it open the door a little bit for you to be able to speak not just as practitioners but also as people? And your own, you I know. think there absolutely have, have have been conversations where, especially for family doctors, as we're in British Columbia, as as working towards the the patient uh, uh, primary care networks, mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. the family doctors have had to take a lot of extra time outside of practice. Yeah. Some of us have who've chosen to yeah. to spend time at particular tables late at night after a full day of work, and yeah. then not necessarily a lot of good good outcomes from there. And then we feel mm-hmm. we get. We feel like uh, we've, we've quote unquote volunteered a lot of our hours away from our family yeah. to do a lot of these things without like uh, a meaningful outcome. Yeah, yeah. I could imagine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just find that kind of interesting that you know if if you're at an event like that and there's a patient overtly speaking about the personal impact, does it help you to be able to say, well, yeah, too, you know, for for me as well in terms of yeah. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I think the I think we're pretty hardwired, sort of culturally, not to speak mm-hmm. about our own personal mm-hmm. um, issues, mm-hmm. impact yeah. on that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that it's part of our. We're not uh, supposed to complain. We're not uh, sure to. I mean, we yeah. we do. We complain bitterly, but we're not, well, supposed, to, we're not supposed to. I think we can, we're definitely not supposed to complain in public. We like, complain suck it up. about um, the. System. The system, but not mm-hmm. about how it impacts you personally. No, I wouldn't. Yeah. Like, I don't think any of us would share yeah. our own personal yeah. healthcare yeah. experiences. Yep. Yeah. Right. At uh, meetings. Yeah, no, we're not. Okay. We're not ready for that vulnerability yet. Mostly. No. Yeah. Okay, let's break that wall down. <laughs> we have to look perfect. <laughs> and, and that's hard, and right? Powerful. And that's hard mm-hmm. because I think that. Um, um, I mean, as a patient, we often see the doctor as uh, traditionally as sort of being up here on that pedestal. Mm-hmm. But that's also hard looking at it from the doctor's perspective mm-hmm. is maintaining that uh, persona uh, for the, to the patient, but then also to your colleagues the whole time, right? Mm-hmm. When, as you said, and I, you know, that's one of the things you wonder about when you're going through such a complex system the whole time, and there's lack of resources, and you can't get your patient into the MRI when you need them, and you're trying to, and you're doing all this admin the whole time because of the complex system. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and you just wonder about how that really, you know, affects things like burnout and all of that. It's mm-hmm. no easy task. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, <sighs> would a sweet potato fry stimulate further discussion? <laughs> I'm stuffed. But I might get you to turn the car on just so I can roll up the window because I'm Okay. Let's we'll see how we're going here. Turn it. Okay. There. Oh, actually, it's fine. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 I think we're still. Turn off the headlight. I just don't want to have to jump. Turn off the <laughs> headlights. Are we going to be Okay. Hang on. Yeah. You just there. did it. That was a success. Okay. Good. Yeah. <laughs> um, otherwise, we're s- it's going to be a an overnight podcast. I'll be bringing my I'll be bringing my car on to jumpstart it, and I'll be like, I, hmm, where does this go? To? Yeah. <laughs> I'll be phoning my husband saying, Laugh, where does this know. go? I'm from the prairies. I'll do it. <laughs> I'm terrified of jumpstarting. Oh really? Sorry, I'm gonna actually answer. I'll have my own healthcare experience. Have sure. yeah. <laughs> Positive and negative moment. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which one goes where? Mm-hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. This is quite the burger to eat, yeah. I must say. I know. Plus, we're, this is why they put us in the front seats, because look at, like, the close-up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hiding behind my, my white spot cups here. <laughs> <laughs> like a wall of white spots. I know, I'm like, oh, well, you know what? I'm trying to make eating a hamburger as gray as possible. Yeah. <laughs> but like, there's car. tomato sauce, there's, I like, a lot of them. Yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> we'll 
we'll see in the editing. <laughs> we'll be like, oh my god, it's terrible. <laughs> yes, how to eat a hamburger on TV? Hmm, not. <laughs> so, what year, Claire, did you start to choose to be a public kind of health advocate? Um, good question. So. I had my brain surgery seven years ago for my brain tumor mm. and it took me almost two years to recover so that's what five years ago mm. and it all started really with me writing a book about mm. my brain tumor experience mm. and out of that then I started speaking mm. to the brain tumor community about recovery from a brain surgery recovery from a brain tumor mm. um, and I did that for a year, 18 months, mm. because I really wanted to connect and dive more into the brain tumor community um, and connect with people that had been through the same experience with me. Mm. But then, <clears throat> probably about two, three years ago, three years ago, I suppose, mm. I really, I was like, well, what was it about my sort of patient uh, journey that stood out for me because I had two misdiagnoses towards the end of when my tumor started doubling in size and what was it that ensured that I basically didn't die and um, this was sparked by a conversation actually that I had with someone down in the US when I was presenting at Stanford Medics on something completely different and I was like well I suppose it was because I did this and I did this and I did this and I was like hmm I suppose I was quite engaged in my healthcare and I did this and all that. And then I was like, I think mm -hmm. I want to be more engaged in talking about this message because I really think this is actually critical. I love speaking to the brain tumor community. That's always where my passion is. I'm still a, a volunteer for the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada in BC. Um, mm -hmm. I've done that for five years. Uh, but I'd like to get more involved on how to inspire people to put their health in their own hands and then how to work with healthcare authorities to do so. So that's only been probably the last two, three years that I've been in this sort of space. And was it your TED talk that was where, is that how you made the leap or was it before then? So I did my TEDx talk in 2018, March, so yeah. not that long ago. Which is when I discovered Claire. I yeah. was there in the oh. audience yeah. live. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. So it's, it's really only been in the last, yeah, probably even two years that I've really... Yeah done a dive more into this collaboration space with patients and so it's been like a little journey every little year there's been something else that I'm like this is really fascinating this is this is a an area that I'm really interested into and I just I always find there's something that opens up to me for me I always say there's doors that close and there are doors that closed mm -hmm. for me after my surgery that I had to go okay I can't do that anymore that's not an option for me anymore but I was like sure something's gonna open up for me keep your eyes open and something did. It was like, okay, I, I wrote a book. I'm like, oh, hey, I didn't know I could write a book, but it was actually my journal, and then I turned it into a book. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's been one of those paths that there's, I just, I, I don't know where it'll mm -hmm. land up going to, but I'm always just open to um, learning from people. There's so many amazing people to learn from in this space that I'm just constantly in awe of. Uh, and so, yeah, what, what's your book, traveling. What was your book called? So the book about my brain tumor is called Two Steps Forward, Embracing Life with a Brain Tumor. Mm. And then I wrote a book um, after my TEDx talk called Activate, How to Save Your Life in a Complex Healthcare System. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But that was, a, that was a teeny weeny book. <laughs> and they're both available on Amazon. Novella. <laughs> yes, yeah. They're both available on Amazon. So, so yeah. One's called Activate and the other one's called Two, Two Steps, Steps Forward. Forward. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. So it's been, it's, I, Call it a, I have a firm philosophy that change change is only constant in my life, having lived in so many places and mm -hmm. <laughs> been through so many experiences. So mm -hmm. I'm just riding the wave and learning a lot and exploring and participating, I think. So, so I don't want to give away what's in your book, but um, yeah. if, do you have a current passion about some particular change in the healthcare system? Mm. Yep. So I am very passionate about finding ways to get people more activated in their own healthcare. Mm. 
because it's, it's not an easy thing to do because some people are in a very vulnerable place when they are ill. Um, <clears throat> and we all, some of us are more engaged or less activated, some are more activated, but I think ultimately um, for the healthcare system, if we sort of moving towards a population that is ultimately aging more, got more chronic diseases, <clears throat> I think we need to be looking at how can we help people manage that for the 23 hours and 40 minutes that they're not at the doctor every day. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Because we see you for that maybe 15 minute appointment that we see you, but how can we get those tools to go out there and actually be activated in the healthcare? And for me, it's anything from, I call it, track, educate, ask, manage. How can you help us track all of our things, educate ourselves, learn how to ask the right questions of you when we see you, and how can we manage our healthcare? And so I think, you know, if, if and it's been shown, the, science, the, the research shows us when you activate and engage people in the healthcare, it has huge benefits for not just the patient, but the healthcare system too. So that's my passion is, is how can you do that? Because, and then it falls into my second passion is, mm -hmm. that creates a better patient experience. So I'm also very passionate about how can we create a better patient experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's funny. I think that's your passion too, isn't it? <laughs> to, to, to activate to activate patients in their health. Uh huh. <laughs> I think that's my passion as well. I love the word activate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's pa it's not passive. Mm -hmm. It's uh -huh. proactive. It's very personal. But it's also, as I said, it's not. It's not just easy to say, oh, you must activate yourself in your healthcare. You need to have the tools and the support to do so mm -hmm. and figure out like where that person is and support them in that in that way. So mm -hmm. I've been lucky enough to have the opportunity to work with various organizations who are thinking that way. And it's so rewarding to see that. I feel like mm -hmm. humbled to mm -hmm. work with them. I'm like, wow, you get this. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome, I think. I remember going to a BC College of Family Physicians mm -hmm forum i think maybe two or three years ago and it's the first time i came across the caregivers bc uh organization caregivers bc mm -hmm. it, and they did have that s some some type of pie chart or some type of statistic that showed <laughs> how how much of the care is actually given by family members <laughs> and how much is given by healthcare. it's like yeah like less than one percent to yep. maybe not even for people with really chronic significant disease right mm -hmm. so, Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's we often, as as clinicians, we get tunneled visioned into our own experiences that we feel that we put so much pressure on our own shoulders that we that we have to be the one to figure out the solution here and yeah. to actualize the solution. But it really is about activating the self management in mm -hmm. patients. And I think in out of from from Vancouver Island, there's self-management BC who's mm -hmm. trying to develop modules mm -hmm. for particular diseases mm -hmm. including including chronic pain and mm -hmm. diabetes and some other and diseases. cancer as well and cancer migration where they have um, coaches and, mm -hmm. and they have online classes yep migration what what's it called self-management BC okay self mm -hmm. BC, yeah. what other resources do you know of Claire for for something like that that, act, that do help in activation of the patients I was just going to say Self Management mm -hmm. BC. Um, that in particular is very good uh, locally <clears throat> for us. That is something where people can tap into it. Um, and as far as I know, that can be done, as you said, in person or online, I think, which is really, really great. Mm -hmm. um, there was something that I was going to add. What was it? I think um, there's an organization called Pain BC that has this yes. new. Yep. Coaching program That's right. as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep. Fantastic for chronic pain. Yeah. They yep. have uh, online goal setting modules, online mm -hmm. tracking, and mm -hmm. they do have telephone support. They have kind of like a concierge service. They have mm -hmm. a compendium wow. of resources for chronic pain. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, and it's, it's interesting what you were saying, though, about uh, a lot of weight being put on the doctor to help the, oh, there you go. Well, there's doctors in the back seat. <laughs> there we are. We disappeared for a while. I think it's interesting what you say about a lot of responsibility being put on the doctor's shoulder. 
um, for that sort of management of the patient mm -hmm. and so forth. But it's interesting when you look as well, like that, there's that also that chart, right, which shows that like conditions uh, or everything that's impacted in our lives, um, and when we have these conditions, like I think it's like 20% or whatever, is actually only is is actually like healthcare related. The rest is all the others like yeah. social determinants of health yeah. is everything else. And mm. but when we activate patients in their care, and we make them, or we look at the other things. You know, you, are you, do you have access to food? Do you have you know where are you working? Do you have a steady income? All those things there. We're able to look at the whole the whole holistic picture. I think it puts us for a better setup. Um, but you're right. That twenty percent still is a lot of weight on your shoulders. So then, when they do walk out the door, you at least hope that they have some uh, direction on how to self-manage their condition. But well, and I would think too that like I, you know how much of it is age-based or <coughs> yep. um, uh, uh, the patient who doesn't want to be activated, mm -hmm. who really wants there's maybe perhaps if you could say more traditional and wants their doctor to direct mm -hmm. them. Yes, yes, that must yes. be. An interesting. That happens quite a lot, actually. Um, patient, a lot of my my patients will say to me, "Well, I'll, you know, we are trained. We're sort of taught that our job is to provide the information and let the patients make their decisions." And mm -hmm. Not uncommonly, I'll, I'll do that with people, and they'll say, Well, you're the doctor, you you're tell me what to do. No pressure. And then I kind of have to push back and say, Well, no, I'm, you know, that's not really my role here. Like, this yep. actually has to be your decision. Um, yep. And some people find that really hard. Yep. So, but at the same time, I mean, it, it is also my role as a professional to say, No, actually, I really think you have strep throat and that you need penicillin right. today, right? Like, yeah. I am a professional. So, yeah. um, I, I am sort of meant to be making recommendations yeah. because yeah. of my training. There are critical moments that, that we need to. So, that's a simple example. But, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think some people are more open to that, like, shared decision making process. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas others are not quite there yet, and as you said, you have to be respectful be. of that, and yeah. they may never be. And mm -hmm. it's a sense of being respectful of that, knowing that that's okay at this point in time. Um, but you know, to keep on seeing if they are open to it. Um, <clears throat> but I think uh, mm -hmm. sometimes patients just aren't. Uh, people might not be aware that they actually can have a contribution. Uh, to their health and how they can do it and that you are open to oh hey you know let's have a chat about this it's like oh oh okay, okay sure mm -hmm. um, so I think exploring that relationship and exploring the contributions that the patient can make um, and and giving them some ideas on how they can be activated I know the first I remember when I came to Canada and I saw one of my specialists and this was before I had my brain tumor and all of that, and it was for something else. And she gave me a diagnosis and she said, okay, she said, this is one of the websites you can go to. And she wrote it down for me, which was amazing. And I think everybody should do because otherwise we go down the Dr. Google mm -hmm. pipe, it can be very, very bad. Um, she gave me the website, she said, you can go home. I want you to look at this and go home and read about this. Mm -hmm. And this is, you will find everything that you need on this website. And if you have any questions, the next time back, we can discuss it then. And so she gave me like, this is your job. Mm -hmm. You go home, you read this now, and figure out if you've got any questions next time you come back in there. And so I think that was great because she gave me direction, she gave me the resources and so forth. And um, she's like, go to and it. Said, and yeah. off you go, that's your job. So I think it's like just planting those little seeds along mm -hmm. the way and giving the right resources. That's a starting block. So that was, Ooh. and the URL, I thought that was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I was like, especially in this day and age, a website addresses. Well, and taking the pressure off herself too, right? Yeah. Like, here's some external information. Mm -hmm. I don't have all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't have to give you all the answers today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Claire's eating a burger. We have to fill the space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, talk amongst yourselves. The food is good. I enjoyed mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Did you eat? Did you eat both your sandwiches? I have yes, I did. Tears left if anybody wants. That's true. Thank you. I'm going to put the basket back there. No. No, that didn't you? Now you can hide behind the sweet chair. Mmm. What about you, Yana? Is there anything that you 
What have, what any new re revelations about the end of one? Hmm. Well, the the patient part of my end of one has been taking a break lately. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, any new revelations about the end of one? I've also been off Twitter curiously. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the revelation is that we all need a break sometimes. Mm -hmm. We all need to pause and yep. and stop the brain and. Um, providers included, right? <laughs> Maybe that's my revelation. I'm trying to think of the last thing that really that really struck me um, in that regard. Probably something on Twitter. Nothing's directly coming to mind. I think for me, it's still as much as it is about relationship. I think I might push back at Andy a little bit because I think at the end of the day, like it's even when you say like it's. I find this, and we've talked about this, and we've talked about this openly on Twitter that you might. And this must, must be the hardest part as a provider where you have this knowledge and this skill and you impart that like, yeah, I took the, you know, we tested you, you have strep throat, this is what you do. And when you have that patient who's like, yeah, no thanks. Like even with something simple, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that must must be mm -hmm. a, the hard. weight of that, the power of that, and the notion that at the end of the day, um, the patient chooses and they may actually choose something that that puts them in harm's way or endangers mm -hmm. them, even maybe p possibly um, something that could be treated really easily and readily, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we experience that on the regular. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I but I mean, I think, um, well, I don't know about you, but having been in a relationship with the majority of my patients for 14 years, I think. Um, I think that the longevity of the relationship helps you to do a better job of what we call finding common ground. And so yeah. Yeah. where you say, okay, well, I reckon, you know, I kind of think you should consider this. Well, I don't think you do that. <laughs> you know, and you yeah. kind of just agree to disagree. Yeah. You just, as long as you feel like um, the person has all the information. I did, I said I wasn't going to talk about patients, but I did have a one patient who did recently pass away and I had a very strong views about what she wanted to know at certain times in her disease trajectory and um, I, I, I worried that she was making decisions about her um, about her plans based on uh, not uh, a realistic understanding of what I thought was likely going to happen in her to her basically yeah um, so it was just, it was hard mm. to navigate that and yeah. um, in the end she was we did come to a place where she was able to hear it um, but yeah it was a big deal yeah, yeah that there. must have been yeah. hard was it mm -hmm. uh, was did it cause some distress in your life to you know knowing yeah. that, that their unrealistic uh, ex um, trajectory that was in that patient's mind um it it I mean yeah I guess mm -hmm. it did yeah this is also a young person so the whole thing yeah. was distressing but um, yeah could yeah. Imagine. um yeah I think it was just worrying to me that I mean on, that that she was um, I think not fully I think she did know though but mm -hmm. she wasn't it was able like to say it. yeah almost like yeah. A, a choice to to deny the potential realities. I, I don't know. It's interesting. Somebody's another provider said to me something about how she's in denial, and I don't. I think denial was an oversimplification of what was going on. I think yeah. what she was really very strongly wishing to live what time remained to her on her own terms. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, Fair enough. Um, and so it's not that I don't think denial is the mm -hmm. way to look at it. Inactive. There's a judgment in that word. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. you know, mm -hmm. yeah. This other doctor sort of gave me the impression sort of did this eye roll and she's in denial and I thought mm, that's not really not mm. what's going on here actually um she's made her choice yeah yeah yeah, sure. yeah about what feels comfortable to yes. yes I'm really struck by the notion of I'm just thinking about a 14 year relationship with your patients that's and amazing. wondering how many people I I certainly don't have that I mean my my yeah. present GP maybe five or six years and I feel mm -hmm. like maybe we're just starting to form something and that's mm -hmm. more based on I think my advocacy work and what I bring mm -hmm. in, into the space so like I'm trying to imagine what would that be like what that would be like to actually 
mm-hmm. have a, like a decade long relationship with the GP that knew me that when I came in. Mm-hmm. Things about that. Me and, do you? Yeah. yeah, my GP um, when we first arrived here mm-hmm. off the boat. <laughs> call it that. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> off the boat sounds like arrived like in the eighteen uh, hundreds. Um, when we arrived from Australia, I was pregnant. And needed to find a GP, so I waltzed down to the nearest place and said, "Are you taking patients?" And they said, "Yes," and Amazing. that was. And I'm still here with wow. the same GPs, husband that and is. wife team, and they are amazing. Mm. They have been with mm. me, our family through thick and thin. Let me tell you, yeah. because I mean, through my misdiagnosis and everything, <clears throat> my GP was. Amazing. She kept on pushing. No, I need you to go to the ER. I need you to do this. I phoned ahead. Do you take the slip? You go in and you tell them this is what I want you to do. And I go in, and then that's where the that's where the trouble happened was in the ER. And then I go back, and then she'd help me out. She's like, okay, you go into the neurologist. This is what you need to do. Da 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 da, and so forth. And she was just amazing. I mean, even so, when I got back from having my surgery. Um, and all that, she transferred me to a different hospital because of the challenges I had where it was, where I was misdiagnosed. She already transferred me to a neurosurgeon at another hospital because she's like, nope. And just honestly, the, um, and I would say I'm probably a, uh, I wouldn't say high maintenance patients, patient. That would be probably derogatory to myself. <laughs> Don't judge yourself. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm a frequent fly patient. I have a lot of, you know, I have my body, I have a lot of, I don't want to be drawing to my body either, but I'm, I visit a lot. You're you routinely know. engaged. I'm routinely engaged with my team. <laughs> you have stuff. I'm stuff. Oh, I'm like, oh, hey, how are you? You have stuff. And so, yeah, so we've been there for a long time. That's amazing. And, um, yeah, I just wrote down in my diary, you know, remember to get Christmas present for doctor, you know. Because wow. I'm like, yeah, because they honestly are. And I nominated her for a best dominate best uh, gp award nice. last oh, year nice. or this year this year nice. this year mm-hmm. because honestly i know that i can count on her when mm-hmm. i need it so mm-hmm. yeah it is nice to have that relationship yeah mm-hmm. because i feel that i feel safe yeah i feel yeah. comfortable i feel um yeah it does make a huge difference yeah mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. do you have a sense that those types of relationships are potentially going to be either more scarce in the future for for our communities, or or, or do you think they'll be the same? I'm asking you to predict the future here. <laughs> well, I think there's two. There, I mean, I have sort of a residue thought that's coming out of what you said, but I think there's two sides to that because as we're talking, I'm thinking about um, like GPs are kind of taking things into their own hands in terms of. Um, making change and exploring what changes. I'm thinking about Daniel Pepe in Ontario and, and you know, not just looking at the digital realm, but, but that, that whole relationship and streamlining and what that means for relationships, right? So it feels like, um, you know, those GPs who are like stepping up like superheroes, right? And um, in a lot of ways representing those who are, are really struggling and feeling the weight of things too. But I'm just thinking like the, the patient, from the patient perspective, I'm realizing listening to you talk that for me personally, I think what has affected that is maybe not necessarily the individual GPs or maybe my moving around, but my perspective on my own health Mm -hmm. based on my experience with alopecia has directly affected whether or not I felt trust. Mm-hmm. So I didn't. I I went. I've always engaged very rarely with the GP, mm-hmm. and the trauma of my diagnosis wasn't necessarily rooted with the GP. It was with a specialist, mm-hmm. and and how that rolled out. And I think just the, the nature of autoimmune mm-hmm. alopecia to begin with. I'm not unusual. I think there's many of us with autoimmune alopecia who just who downplay mm-hmm. um, the role of that disease mm-hmm. expression in our lives. So um, the two sides, right? Yeah. Um, yeah what GPs are doing individually, which is, I think, and obviously I'd like to hear what both of you have to say about mm. that, right? Because there's yeah. a community in there too, yeah. right? Um, but then also the, the role that the patient plays in that um, as to, you know, how they affect whether or not there is actually a bonding that occurs with their GP. Yeah. I'd be interested as well to see going forwards how healthcare changes because I, I believe that we should have more presence in the community like in primary health care especially with the way that things are going with like aging populations chronic diseases for sure so that needs to be supported mm-hmm. um two things one is um how's technology going to change that 
and is it going to change it? Mm-hmm. I don't think it should, you know, it should be a support, not a replacement. Mm-hmm. But number two is, what about the generations? Yeah. So, like, fine for me, yes, if I want to just get a script, I'd be happy to, like, Skype, whatever, FaceTime, my GP and get a script for her, or from somebody else, that's okay. But, like, the millennial generation, don't, a lot of them don't have primary care providers because they don't see it as a necessity, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a very different... Um, relationship with healthcare between the generations. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how that's going to play into Mm -hmm. the setup of primary healthcare, even though we need to shift healthcare from acute to chronic and shift out of like just hospital into community. I wonder how the generations are going to play into that. I actually wonder. And does, does, is activation by default a characteristic of our children who are both in their early teens? uh, Are they just naturally uh, active? Because they know that they, a noise says to me, my son, I can hear that. So my son always says to me, oh, yeah, mom, I know. I've got to track my own records and educate myself. He's <laughs> got the acronym down. You know, so I agree with you. Yeah. Is, is by default, yeah. are you going to have children who are more activated in their care because their parents are, you know, opponent, uh, proponents of it? Or even yeah. just because they're digital users, right? Yeah, like, yeah. They, I know. they Google, they're yeah. not going to be told not to Google. Yeah. <laughs> and and yeah. digital health technology is becoming more... Uh, a more a bigger thing but yeah I just wonder how technology and then also the generations are going to impact yeah. primary health care mm-hmm. I don't know what do you think about that what do you see in the yeah already? what do you think about that and see um I mean we see um well okay this is just what are aspect. teenagers like in my, in my, I don't have much Sorry, what are teenagers like in your practice when they come in alone without parents oh uh they, they don't do that alone, no no <laughs> I get I get quite a few yeah. and they seem to yeah there's a demand for virtual services mm-hmm. they mm-hmm. they just don't know that it exists I think there's a demand and we have there is a big push one major company in Canada is now pushing ahead with that I won't mention them by name mm-hmm. in the podcast oh um, sure you can <laughs> but I think what we it's funny because they recently used a, a band aid to, to market themselves yeah <laughs> they sent sent us band aids in the mail. No. GPs branded band aid band oh. like oh oh such that's a company brand band aid. That's kind of ironic. I know is that the metaphor. <laughs> well, that's what one of our colleagues says. That's so funny. I this thought she meant a band aid. Yeah. Band- I thought she meant someone used a band aid. I no, like the metaphor. Is I'm like, huh? Band aid solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe I'm naive, but I'm hopeful that that will never replace relationship-based care because I still do think yes. that there's yeah, yeah, that's what value I'm saying. in that. Um, but I do it's think that there is an ab- absolutely a need for us to um, mm-hmm. create uh, um, access to our pr- the providers. That's yeah. one of the primary like targets for quality because it's not okay if you have a, I mean, it, it, it's great if you have a relationship with some, with a provider, but if you can't, it takes you six weeks to get in to see them and that's no, I know, totally I know. That's, I know, useless. I know. So you, you do need to have a balance. And I think that probably um, f- phone based or yeah. uh, email is a bit problematic to me, but um, like virtual, yeah, Skype or, or something yeah. of that nature. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think we're, many of us would be open to that. It's mm-hmm. just about trying to, figuring out how to what the criteria are behind it how to make it accessible it yeah the um, pain in my own <laughs> office we're trying to implement i know we're maybe a bit behind the times but we're trying to implement um a patient portal like a mm-hmm. oh, i'm not sure if that's cool. the right i'm not sure if that's the right word we're just going to start with online booking yeah that's what my doctor does which that's is fantastic. so far behind the times because mm-hmm. every other dentist and you yeah. know, can't do like, online booking <laughs> every other kind of place you might go that uh has online yeah. booking right so we're going to start with that that's and great i think what we're trying to do is uh, use technology to automate some of the things that our staff have been doing that they don't need to do that they can yeah. then use their time to yeah. do other things that are more beneficial yeah. to yeah. the patients who need their time yeah, yeah. so that's yeah. the hope for that I've yeah. seen that shift with my GP just in the course of the last year and in fact the last time I went to see him he was in the room before I was Whoa. what's wrong with yeah. this picture <laughs> yeah you see that's what technology should do yeah. is support not yeah. replace but support yeah. so it gets rid of some of the superfluous yeah. stuff so that they can spend more time yeah. with yeah. the patient so, so, that, yeah. so that's great that you're looking at that yeah. that's yeah. fabulous and I'll hopefully be able to use it as well for mm-hmm. um um 
po- like population level, like flu shot recalls or, mm-hmm. yes. you know, like yeah. secure yeah. messaging to, because that's always been a stumbling block for us is the time needed to target everyone in the practice who was eligible for a flu shot or everyone yeah. who needed their diabetes follow up or yeah. like the human power needed to accomplish that is mm-hmm. was beyond anything that we could afford. achieve mm-hmm. and afford. We're just yeah. always having to be in this reactive place instead of a proactive place. Yeah. So. And that's where primary care is the best when it's proactive and preventative, yeah, right? And, absolutely. And where we can kind of save people from those trips to the emergency room. And right absolutely. now, mm-hmm. so at least 25 to 30 percent of emergency room trips could be taken care of in yeah. a primary care office, oh, but yeah. unfortunately, For access sure. hasn't, yeah. hasn't existed. So. Yeah, I can believe that. Mm-hmm. I can believe that. So, um, yeah, I mean, fingers crossed that that would be the way forward is that as you said you've got increased uh access to primary uh care for everybody because then that'll alleviate uh, issues in the acute care setting and then that that should be the way forward right as we said so yeah that would be the ideal scenario mm-hmm. that i think historically the acute care uh, hospitals and stuff have had more political attractiveness to, mm-hmm. to get more funds when it comes down to the ministry dividing up funds. But I think we're going to see a shift in that, hopefully. Hopefully the primary care and preventive care yep. will get more funding, even though it's, it's less attractive, not as flashy. Or yep. What do you think is the strongest push in that regard? What do you mean? In push. terms of making, like you're saying, hopefully, either we're going mm-hmm. to see that. What's bringing that change? I think it's just the, the mm-hmm. s- systems leaders with with awareness. Uh, and, <laughs> so, and I think we have ne- we have nearly a million patients in this province without access to primary care. That's right. a lot. And wow. that's a lot. And the thing is with BC as well, it's such and well anywhere in Canada, right? It's uh, our our geographic sort of representation in Canada is everything is so vast and removed mm-hmm. and I'm sure that that's probably just maybe in Vancouver there's issues like that but then you get to some of the more of the remote areas um, and whether it's in primary care or access to specialists and so forth I, I realized just how big Canada is I was in St. John's mm-hmm. a couple of weeks back and I'm like oh my god you fly all the way to Toronto then you fly three hours up and like some of the people speaking there were like yeah but they have all this burnout because there's like one GP up in the middle of this town but there's like however many people there are and that GP is doing everything it's not just like they, they're doing everything that possibly can um, and so forth and so I think that access becomes a challenge in whether it's urban but also in rural areas yeah. it's a really big big challenge so yeah so some of the approaches that the ministry is taking right now is providing allied health services to mm-hmm. kind of supplement a, a GP's oh, yeah. ability to yeah to create capacity and mm-hmm. um, we're still yet to see how that pans out and I think there are some people who hope to do evaluation on that to see mm-hmm. can we extend one GP's reach further mm-hmm. because we can't seem to build more GP's, yeah. we can't seem to yeah. recruit GP's mm-hmm. in a fast enough way, and we can't afford to pay yeah. that many GP's. And is that with a nurse practitioner? Mm-hmm. Or is that allied professional, or how yeah. do we? It's like a nurse. A nurse. Okay. Yeah, it's like okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the problems that I'm having though with the way that they're going about it is that they're um, they're sort of pushing this sort of stat a, a sort of a status quo model though, in the sense that so my practice, I'm carrying X number of patients. Um, I do a decent job of juggling access but I would like to be able to do a better quality job with the people mm-hmm. that I care yeah. of. Yeah. Yeah. And I realize that more people need access to care but I I want I don't want to just add and add and add and add patients without with, increasing and quality. then yeah and, and impact and in just, quality of those you do have. Yeah and so then mm-hmm. and then just continue to have every day be this kind of crazed kind of rat race of running from one mm-hmm. patient yeah. to the next to yep. provide access and then having preventative or um, you know deeper conversations sort of just fall off the rate off the wayside mm-hmm. because there's no time because you're just trying to meet the sort of put out the fires left right mm-hmm. and center you know yeah so I, yep. I worry a bit about um, the push to uh, 
uh, add more and more people into the existing practices. Um, could you two talk a bit about your Alaska, your Alaska experience and what you yes. brought back? And more particularly, I'm thinking in terms of the passage of time between that experience and now and what, what you've been thinking about that you would, mm -hmm. you think could actually be integrated here in BC yeah. that you saw in Alaska. Yeah. So that sounded really good. good. Like a phone on you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, so in August, Lawrence and I traveled with a uh, about what twenty other, eighteen to twenty other doctors people. and healthcare leader people. Yeah, not all of them. Wow. Doctors up to Anchorage, Alaska, to visit a place called South Central Foundation. Uh, they're known for something called the Nuka System of Care, and this model has evolved over de a couple of decades Two at decades, least, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, but started back, I'm, I'm probably not going to do this justice, but they started with a sort of a small group of people who recognized that the state of the health of the Alaska Native population in that area was terrible, basically, and the healthcare system was not working, and they needed to completely overhaul it and, and redo it. Um, and they were able to take control over the system themselves. I can't recall exactly how they achieved that, but anyways. You had to go lobby the federal government and the states to, to, to dissolve the current, that, at right. that time, the Indian Health Services, which okay. <clears throat> was dysfunctional. Right, so they were able, I, and I, got, I seem to remember them saying that um, the prevailing view was that it couldn't, they couldn't possibly make it any worse. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. they were able oh, to goodness. take control. Wow. And they wow. and it's community owned, right? It's yeah. No, so no, they have yeah. a very different paradigm, a wow. very dis different philosophy. They have um, patients there are known as customer owners, and they have a board. They're they're basically like name or a nonprofit organization that draw, is able to draw funding from a multitude of sources and are run by a by a board of directors that are comprised of. Community members. Yes, it's, it's all community members, the tri tribal leaders, pretty mm -hmm. much. Okay. Right. It, and the, the population that they serve is about 65,000, and they're all indigenous peoples of the okay. south, of south central Alaska. Okay. Right. Is this target is this specifically community focused? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and I remember them talking about how when they first started, um, their priority <clears throat> was to go to the community to ask, okay, what are your health? care mm -hmm. priorities mm -hmm. so they didn't kind of come in saying we need you to deal with your diabetes and your COPD and your hypertension right. mm -hmm. we want to know what your priorities yeah. are and what I recall is that their priority was the trauma the, the intergenerational trauma the um, uh, mm -hmm. domestic violence um, mm -hmm. and social, of social determinants of that sort of yeah. thing and so yeah. that was their starting point wow. for their um, for their healthcare system mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah. it all it revolutionized everything over the twenty years. They they developed better schools for the kids. They developed linkages to food security. Because mm -hmm. that's that twenty percent, yeah. right? Yeah, uh -huh. everything else think, is the eighty percent. Yeah, yeah. And, think about it. yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so the other things that it's, it's funny because um, what some people have said is that each of the eighteen or twenty of us who went took away different key learnings from those two days. Yeah. But my sort of trying to get to the key principles. One is that they had this really clear vision of what they were trying to achieve. They had a really strong leadership team and they were very, um, like the vision including the customer owner community guarded piece. Um, and they were very focused on collecting data yes. to guide, to support mm -hmm. and guide what they were doing. Yeah, that's yeah, so important. So almost 20 years, 20 years ago, they, they already yes. had involvement with the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and Institute of Healthcare Improvement had a way of, of measurement, mm -hmm. of process improvement mm -hmm. measurement that they had uh, taken a lot from um, the kind of the car manufacturing systems out in, mm -hmm. out in, the, in Japan and, yeah. and brought back. It was like Edward Demings and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lean yeah. management? Uh, some of it was lean management, but a lot of it was how to use measurements in improvement, how to, okay. how to make metrics meaningful. Yeah. Okay. And so they showed us two textbooks when we were when we were out there uh, that they actually make all of their um, their leaders learn from these particular textbooks mm -hmm. about using measurement adequately and in each of their primary care teams they actually visualize their performance mm -hmm. and their performance is measured on 
how well they're doing in preventive services for their mm-hmm. patients. And then they gamify it. They, they make the teams kind of com- compete with each other. And it's not just going <laughs> to be one person. It's not just the doctor, so it's not just me. The team. It's me, it's my nurse, it's my nurse practitioner. It's on my team and it's a behavioral health consultant which is really cool yeah Yeah, so they yeah so i think like over the decades they evolved this amazing primary care integrated primary care team model um that i suspect would be very similar to what we would end up with if we went through the same process but i think what many of us probably thought was that it wouldn't really work to just sort of transpose that model into bc the, you would miss that whole community engagement piece that mm-hmm. was so core to that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Because then, so so they did talk a lot about sh- the shift in thinking that comes with being referred to as a customer owner. Mm-hmm. And like when you talk about patient activation, for example, those people are, the people who are referred to as customer owners are expected to take initial like to be like customer you're a customer owner yeah. you own mm-hmm. your health you have a responsibility and you have yeah. a responsibility even Catherine Godley said she was feeling guilty that she had put her annual <laughs> physical she's the CEO do you remember yeah. when she was talking about that yeah you feel um, guilty because part of that game is that you you are as a patient you you're playing the game too because you want your health to be good yes. so your team looks good <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, wow. yeah. Jeez. there's so much ownership yeah because you're the owner you yeah. Know, if you if your team doesn't perform well, you're so like, oh, she knows that her not going in for her physical impacts her team's stats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Numbers, numbers, numbers. <laughs> well, wow. yeah, but still, that's interesting. But it's not just numbers. It's wrapped yeah. up in that ethos of we're a community. Yeah. We take yeah. care of each we other. We do it and together. We're all connected. Mm-hmm. We're and all there's connected. a key word, and it came out right from the beginning when you started talking. And it, I've been thinking about this whole time. Community. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How do we define that here? Just being part of a province that doesn't quite work the mm-hmm. same way mm-hmm. like what are the characteristics that that bind us yeah. or bring us together mm-hmm. as a community if we were to talk about i know a health community it's going to start at, at that basic level is it How like you do that is it a like a, is it like a health care authority of which we have multiple yes. in vancouver uh, in, in um bc but right? what binds the, I know, the mem- I know. The me- you, it, we don't think of ourselves as mm-hmm. members of a health care authority it's something that sits over top I know. of us I know. Mm-hmm. that would be i don't know how you would shift I that don't i don't think you could shift yeah. that most physicians don't even see them as part see themselves as part, part of, of a health authority they see yeah. themselves as a part or it's uh, subcontractors managed by or, yeah mm-hmm. coordinated by yeah, we have very little management by. From yeah them. no yeah. i think most of us are we we consider ourselves to be independent. Independent, yes, yeah, yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we are actually the opposite of a community. Yeah. <laughs> We're in that so, but so here's another thought, because I keep yeah. thinking about like if there was one question we could kind of um, highlight in this car, it's like. It, because we're all here in BC, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what are some of the solutions or what are the big questions we mm-hmm. want to bring forward in BC? Could you take that model that you learned about and could you transpose that just into okay, let's say your business, right? But if you it could, you, what what would you take from that model that you learned about, mm-hmm. and how would you transpose it or yeah, just transfer it yeah. into your community yeah. of patients? Yeah, well, is that do more doable? Um, yeah, that's a good point. I don't know that it's doable in the context of the current uh, way that a private family practice office works. Mm-hmm. However, there is a movement in, in BC around community health centers. You may have seen mm-hmm. some of this discussed in the media. And I think the community center health center model comes the closest to like replicating um, what's so essential does CHC I would say the CHC model because by definition the CHC model um, requires that the CHC is governed by a community board and that there is a, there is also by definition to be called the CHC you're you're um, by definition expected to be addressing the social determinants of health mm-hmm. as well okay um, okay yeah so I think that's one thing that, that I've been working on with Randall West Shore in our, in our areas trying to trying to bring something like that to fruition. Mm-hmm. There's very low awareness of yeah. community health centers in, in, in my area. I mm-hmm. think we have one, we call it Roots, and it's usually it's focused more on refugee population, but mm-hmm. there's nothing for general population. 
Are they yeah. created? Can they generate themselves? How do they come they can, to be? They kind of, you just need sleep. a bunch of physicians and a bunch of community a members. A community health center? Yeah, you need to be a nonprofit organization with a community board. Mm-hmm. You need a yeah. leadership cool. board and you just go. Sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so there is a group of us as a, like a small group of us physicians who sort of thought, oh, this would be great. We should try to do this. And we couldn't quite figure out how because we didn't have a community nonprofit and a community board. Um, and we have been lucky enough to find a community organizer, not find them, connect with them um, in our community. Uh, and they are keen to work with us to develop uh, into a CHC. They're already nice. providing, oh, interesting. they're already providing um, a s- large amount of the mental health services in the community. Yeah. And they're interested in expanding into the cl- more clinical services. So nice. it should work. Nice. Mm. Except yeah. it, we seem to just have to kind of get the attention of the Ministry of Health. <laughs> so how many, do we know offhand, in a spot, how many CHCs in BC? I don't know offhand. I don't know either. There's mm-hmm. lots of interest. Uh-huh. Lots of people are interested in the idea. Um, it's the process to go through to yeah, the get there. Is yeah. a bit unclear. Yeah. There's also, I would just say that there has historically been this belief that CHCs are only for complex or high needs or underserviced populations, mm-hmm. and that's actually well, many of them kind of do have a focus like that. That's mm-hmm. not a requirement. Yeah. A lot of the CHCs in Ontario um, are catchment area based. And so they're, they're sort of like geographically mm-hmm. based. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that makes sense. sense. So that would be how it And that makes sense. Is. Well, that makes That's sense to me. It's like a community yeah. rec center, mm-hmm. a community exactly. whatever. It'd be like a community health yeah. center. Yeah. Exactly. That makes sense in my mind. Do you have much mind. context from this, from the patient experience? Because I don't, like in I terms of dialogue. Or, I'm just wondering what we do no. to elevate the dialogue around this. No, I don't have much. No, I don't have much uh, mm. background on this. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it would start about with with patients actually looking at the, the numbers of of who actually does not have a family doctor and, yeah. and how big of a problem that yeah. could be to to a particular person you know, and how that impacts the trajectory of their well-being. Mm-hmm. Um, Contrasting that to how it does look for those patients who, are, who participate in the CHC or receive yeah. the services from? I would guess so. I don't know if there's much data about that in, in our it's system funny. yet, but we would have mm-hmm. to look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. One of, some of the things that do, don't translate from Alaska are that they have some federal funding and they, every practitioner is is uh, salaried on a salary basis. So there's no fee for service mm. in the Alaska system. Yeah. Um, and what, what the te- they've been able to do with their teams is they've been able to really tr- uh, meet the patients wherever they are. If the patient wants service by telephone, wants service mm-hmm. by some email or whatever, they'll take care of that. Yeah. So that the physician is doing only what the physician needs to do and then the the rest of the team members really help out with all the other stuff mm-hmm. so it ends up where the physician's seeing about 10 to 12 patients per day in person mm-hmm. and really spending time because these are the patients yeah. who really need the in, in-person care and then the other ones are like uh, sometimes refills or, or whatever else is and then and they're feeling good about doing that mm-hmm. and it they've in their teams of about five people plus the GP they're able to carry a load of about 1,100 patients each. And they found mm-hmm. that that was the sweet spot mm-hmm. and that prevented extra use of the emergency room. And how many patients do you each have? I have a little over 1,300. I have uh, less than that. I'm half time, uh, so I'm about 600. Okay. Without I think you that have infrastructure. a pretty complex population. I do have well, a complex right? population. I have a very mixed population. Okay. Mm-hmm. But without, again, without that infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah, it would really be nice. So one of the things they have at uh, South Central is one of the team members is referred to as the RN case mm-hmm. manager. Mm-hmm. So it's a nurse who has the clinical yeah. uh, training, but who also has the time and the designation to make sure that people's preventative health measures are up to date. That mm-hmm. yeah. they're you know for complex patients who do need active case management, they're mm-hmm. doing that piece. Yeah. yeah, following up, actively following mm-hmm. up. Um, might be at risk and you know that sort of piece um, and keeping the whole team up that's to date, uh, yeah that's fantastic people, well mm-hmm. where people yeah. are at and yeah. so on so yeah and, and so in the Alaska system there's about six or seven people managing 1100 mm-hmm. in our system typically it's 
a physician and one MOA, managing like fifteen hundred or, yeah. or two thousand sometimes yeah. patients. So you can imagine the quality and it yeah. falls through the cracks in our system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dropped appointments, dropped referrals, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, calls, totally. yeah. dropped lab results and everything. And, yeah. But yeah. but we just keep pushing on and we have this assumption on the macro level that, oh, actually physicians are actually doing a good job. So mm. let's let's ask them to do some more. <laughs> you know, there's no there has been zero actual robust assessment of quality mm. of what we're what we're currently cool. doing. And yeah, it's just based on quantitative, not yes. qualitative. And yeah. in our culture we're not really able to be vulnerable and say, actually I'm doing a shitty job. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I don't feel there's no, there's no crack on that. No, well, you can't Still, because yeah. if, if you say that, you're pretty much inviting lawyers into your, yeah. into oh, your yeah. house and you're inviting people to check on your, do audits on everything Wait, that you do. So, I bet, okay, I don't think we say I'm doing a shitty job, but I could do I could, There's room I'm for improvement. Yeah. But I do think yeah. that at a lot of our meetings over the last year or two, we have like articulated how. Yeah we could be doing so much better yeah. yes. if yeah. we had the following things in place. Yeah. We're trying to yeah. articulate that um, yeah. to say, uh, but yeah, it's not, we're not being super successful mm -hmm. at it communicating it. It was interesting. And this was the first time that I've experienced this and I've seen a multitude of specialists, but I went to a specialist just this last week and um, I've seen her before. But I went in and she said, oh, you're going to see my nurse first. So I was like, oh, this is new anyway. That's fine. And she said, and then I will, I'll see you. So I was like, okay, great. So I went in and saw the nurse who did a thorough history with me, everything, typed everything into the computer, did an overview, did a full assessment of me. And then she called the specialist in. She then presented me. I felt like I was on a ward round with like a <laughs> resident or something. She then presented me and she said, and oh. please feel free to add in if there's anything that I've left out or misrepresented. She presented me to the specialist huh? and then we had a discussion, the three of us, and then the specialist, you know, added on, did any extra tests or whatever she needed to do with me to make sure she had the full picture. But I felt like that was really good use of time. Yeah. yeah. Because she was, she was rotating. She had all these mm. patients and she, um, she's a busy specialist, mm -hmm. but she was getting a really comprehensive look at yeah. me as a patient because the nurse did an incredibly thorough, um, assessment of me she got the nut nutshell notes on the, the nurse note knew what she needed to highlight because she was a nurse at, who I could see was very specialized in that specific area mm -hmm. um, and then they discussed and I said okay this and this and then she was like okay I need you to make sure she gets this test this test this test dun, 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 dun. okay the, and she, they had this whole discussion going on and, and cool. I was like this is awesome and, and there's space for you to contribute like oh, they give you that window to absolutely. clarify and very like three of us having a discussion nice. and then and then at the end she says okay this is our action plan dum, dum, dum. and nurse so and so, she's going to do this and this and this now before we leave, and then uh, I'll see you back here in two weeks or whatever. Any questions? And then she left the room. The nurse wrapped up, and she went back to see the other patient who had sort of was like rotating, mm -hmm. you know, clockwork. But I thought, now that was really good use of time because mm -hmm. I wasn't sitting in the specialist office for. She actually had me the last time there for an hour, and I was like gobsmacked. I was like, wow, wow that was amazing. Yeah. Um, but I was in her with her probably for 10, 15 minutes. Um, but then she was able to get through mm -hmm. all the patients, but mm -hmm. I felt the quality of my care was outstanding. Because of the collaboration. Yeah, because the two of them tag team I got, I felt my quality of care was, was fantastic. Yeah. And the action plan and everything and the two, two of them working together to sort of review my case. So I thought that was an interesting yeah. way. I know that's at the specialist mm -hmm. level, but I can see how that potential for primary health care, you know, the tag team with the different people on the team. Yeah. It's not like the GP has to be the only sole provider. It's like, no. let's do the assessment here. What are you here for? It's like the triage, mm -hmm. but let's take mm -hmm. it a little bit further. Let's yeah. check all your mm -hmm. other things that are up to date. Da -da -da. Oh, I saw you had this test here. Did you go and get it? Let's check your results. Oh, your results mm -hmm. haven't come in. Let me quickly wow. go get those. You know, so when mm -hmm. the GP comes yeah. in, you can have everything in order so the GP can put their skills and attention onto what yeah. is right there in front of them. So, yeah, it be interesting. Mm -hmm. That's similar to what we do with residents when residents work with us and, mm. and yeah. students in our, yeah. in our clinic, and it, it definitely amplifies our reach and our ability. And oh, yeah. It allows us to step back a little bit and we can see things from yeah. a different perspective mm. and sometimes pick up 
the clinically relevant issues yep. a lot better because yep. we have that perspective. Yep. Yeah, it it's it's the power of teamwork. It's, yeah. it's the power of teams. It's to, you know, two brains better yeah. than one. And all oh, yeah. It's interesting actually because that's what I grew up in. Because I went, my doctor was at a family medicine clinic in a hospital, mm. so there were always students, and yeah. there were <laughs> nurse practitioners even. I can remember. Mm. And, um, I can't remember her name. She was a nun. She was a Catholic nun who was a nurse practitioner. Really? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Really? Um, yeah. So we just, I yeah. just sort of took that for granted that this, like, am I going to see you today? Yeah. I'll yeah. see one of five doctors. I, I might see a student doctor, you know, <laughs> well, um, you, you, you know, a sister, yeah. Kofner, Joan Kofner, you know, amazing. might be, I just yeah. said her name, um, you know, might be seeing me today. And I didn't think anything of that, yeah. right? So yeah. it's pretty cool as a kid. And then I lost that afterwards. Imagine yeah. you worked with Mother Teresa. If Mother Teresa was on your team. <laughs> we, I guess there's so Mother much. Teresa. Uh, I don't know. I I'm not sure that having Mother like Teresa pressure. on on my team would it's like pressure. improve. I don't know. Does that happen? I should say that Gandhi on your team. Um, maybe maybe Gandhi. Gandhi seems kind of passive. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> just sit there. I feel um, like having like someone who is like the epitome of goodness on my team mm-hmm. could could like shut people down. Like <laughs> people need to be able to share That's with the doctor up. like what like the oh t- yeah, oh, Teresa. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. they might they might feel too bad. They're like, oh, I can't share that. I'm like, I'm yeah, oh, I'm supposed wow. to be feeling up, but I had a really what? bad day. Well, no, really. I mean, sometimes you have people. I'm sure she cuts. Gotta be honest with you, Doc. I've done like blah 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 blah. <laughs> but I really need the following tests, right? Like, yeah, and you're like, oh, okay. You need, you need to test me, stuff. yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I don't know. Mm. <laughs> yeah, it might not be the sharing type of I'll moment. Re, I'll re- I don't know. I would be thinking. I'll, I'll rethink I, I think you need to rethink your, your, team, your team composition. Okay, okay, you need fine. to do some team now. And Sister Joan was in street clothes, so I didn't really, you know, focus on the fact that she was a nun. But <laughs> oh, Claire, what do you? I'm so drawing a blank, blank here from the patient perspective. What? Who's talking? What's being talked about in terms of elevating this more collaborative approach? And what can we do as patient advocates in BC? to elevate this conversation? Because um, I feel like I'm, I'm like thinking at ground zero, but I would, whenever I start at ground zero and think, oh my God, that's a great idea, I want to do something about it, I stop myself and think, somebody else got to be talking about this. <laughs> who, else is, who else is talking about this in the patient community? What work, like you know, Patient Voices BC, when I think about the work we do with them, it's more mm. um, like patient feedback voices and, work and all con- that. Yeah, con- contribution. Yeah. But in terms of like the advocacy mm. voice and the elevation of... And you particularly talk on the primary healthcare side yeah, of things. Because I think that's a big part of our dis- the, the value yeah. of this discussion. Yeah, amongst the four I of can us. definitely ask because I know who to ask. Because cool. I think we, we need to, I I'd like to take the energy of this conversation yeah, I agree. as, yeah. you know, obviously collaboratively amongst the four of us, yeah, but then we're particularly yeah, in agree. our front seat silo here. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. run with it. Yeah. I think what, what's holding us back a lot is that there are people who walk at the costs. They're like, a yeah. team costs a lot mm-hmm. of money. Yeah. And you're going from a really lean team at two to now ten, and people with benefits and all that. But you're not looking afford, at the long term. We're not terms looking of at costs, the, mm-hmm. and because yeah. no one's actually set up to measure. Yeah. So you, mm-hmm. if you're not measuring the actual yes. cost savings in the yes. acute. Yes. To, to justify yes. these teams, yes. you're never going to move there. Because is that where you bring in all the sort of the, quote unquote theoreticals in terms of social determinants of health and how they yeah. reduce costs? How do you costs and, that? Yeah. You need to be able to, to, to do that. I think, too, that um, one thing that sort of troubles me a bit is the way that um, our different healthcare professions are sort of engaging in a bit of a turf war right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that I think is really unproductive. Yeah. And I don't know I, I don't know how to get around that or mm-hmm. th- or move through that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what you're talking about, but I've heard a lot of stuff about <laughs> nurse practitioners saying yes, that I was I'm just that. as good or better than yeah. a, a GP and then GPs yeah. are like Nah, 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 I'm, yeah. I'm better than you and yeah it's silly yeah, it, yeah. I mean yeah. it does it is it's it's silly but it's real at the same yeah. time yeah I mean like people yeah. are getting really defensive and yeah. feeling like they need to to justify themselves or mm-hmm. say what their value is when it, um, and it, it's getting into this back and forth either or you know thing um, that is just going nowhere basically. So yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 
what, you're, you're what losing to do about that. Yeah, we're losing focus on what um, the community is there for, right? We're, we're trying to aim for the betterment of, mm-hmm. of, of patient outcomes and, yeah. and patient and yeah, health instead professional of talking experience. About how we can work together, mm-hmm. we're talking about the, you know, we should be, the, you know, well, Sort of. Yeah, give us more money, not them more money. And too, yeah, yeah. I mean, like a- asking the patients like what they want, but also I think what they're doing. Like I even think about conversations I've had in the last couple of days. Mm-hmm. I met with an older neighbor of mine today because she's been very forceful about wanting to. In- she hasn't actually told me what it is, but there's some. She keeps inviting me to this Zoom phone call that I oh. need to participate in, and so finally I sat down with her today. I'm imagining but, like an 80 year old person yeah. inviting you to Zoom. Yeah, but it wasn't like she wasn't going to lead the conversation. There's oh. someone she needed me to hear her from. So essentially, she's done research in support of her husband's health, mm-hmm. and she's found something that's private, mm-hmm. very focused, mm-hmm. that she's accessed that has made a huge difference for her husband. Mm-hmm. But I think the that type of you know, stepping away from my neighbor, that that type of when people are taking their health into their own hands, perhaps in a more reactionary, isolated, segregated way, right? And and looking at some of those experiences and, and talking to patients and, and users, you know, mm-hmm. in, in that regard, I think can be super revealing because people are, yeah, often functioning in bubbles, taking, you know, action in their own hands that is siloed and segregated and this is the that collaborative um trusting integrated nature um i don't know how much um you know research is done in that regard how much there's voice given to that mm-hmm. but i definitely hear those conversations around me people telling me about the things that they're doing that it's an integrated into our healthcare system anymore, right? you know and of course you know um, you talk about nurse practitioners, but and I'm specifically thinking about Twitter. Um, you know some of the name calling and the finger pointing you see in terms of um, mm-hmm. non-traditional, quote unquote, you know naturopaths, other forms of, yeah. of other Health practitioners care. that people are engaging with. Yes, mm-hmm. patients absolutely. are using these services. Absolutely. So whether or not you as a and I'm not pointing you to obviously, right? But you know different types of practitioners yeah. who have opinions about yeah. other types of practitioners. Yeah. How do we stop that? Because patients are using all, we're picking and choosing our services yep. based on yeah, what works for us. Yes, so we actually see, like, you know, for us, it's more like, okay, just can't y'all just get, no, we want you to get along, not yes. can't you. Yeah. Please get along. Like, yeah. do it now. Because <laughs> that would have more value for us. Yeah. Do you look at yeah. what I've seen from some of our colleagues is that some of my colleagues who are very, uh, you know, based, they, based, they try to say that everything's based on randomized controlled trials. I only work out of this evidence. Um, and and what what's happening is that patients are gravitating towards people who have who who are attuned with with their hopes and their fears and things like that. So the the people who are they're with practitioners like who are actually good at communicating. Yeah. And then so and we we have some of our colleagues are are not that great at communicating. Uh-huh. And then so it becomes that's the issue that there's a communication challenge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But then they start to blame. S- the lack or 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 presence of evidence of of we, we, I have evidence in mind and they don't have evidence, but patients are actually well, just want someone to communicate. Yeah, yeah. Someone just yeah. want they just want yeah. someone to, yeah. to listen listen to them. and and to listen. listen. Yeah. listen and empathize is so with them. Yeah. That's and empathize what, that's with them. That's a big yeah. part of relationship based care. Is, For sure. Is I'm in their family medicine textbook on the way over on the ferry. You are. Um, <laughs> and the, totally gonna mock you the that sort way. of quote was about how of all the con- of all the reasons a, doc- a person would visit a doctor, um, something like eighty percent of eighty or ninety percent of what people would go to a doctor for uh, will either go away by themselves or be something you can't actually do anything about anyways. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what you and what the person needs is the relationship. Yes. And Interesting. And then, you know, the remaining 10 or 20 percent, you're bringing your biomedical skills to. But um, mm. really, the majority of what we do is our... It's quite wise, yeah. Is our, For sure. Is our relationship. And so. My favorite thing that I do with my naturopath is when she asks me to open up my online lab results mm-hmm. and she looks at them over time. Yeah. And then she breaks it down and explains things to me because mm-hmm. then I walk out of there and the next time I look at it on my own, you know I you know what I'm looking at. Yeah, that's very useful. And I know my GP doesn't have time to do that in yeah. 7.5 mm-hmm. minutes, right? Yeah. But mm-hmm. that, as you say, that's. It's not necessarily yeah. any action that yeah. needs to be taken. It's that context and relationship. That's building. very valuable. Yeah. 
For I, sure. I think there's also an issue of the family physician sometimes feeling, I get paid about, take home about $17 from this interaction with you that lasted 30 to 40 minutes. And then a naturopath mm. will get 200 bucks. Yeah, I totally get it. And, and stuff. Like that. And then so there's, there's this, sometimes the phys family physicians are speaking from the point of somebody's ripping you off. Someone's stealing you, stealing your money mm. just to listen to you. But if that's a value to a patient and... Mm. And it's and, also and not about the naturopath and the GP, it's about the systems. Exactly. Yeah. Naturopathy is not integrated into yeah. this system. No. In right. the States, they're often integrated into mm -hmm. the clinics, right? Obviously, mm -hmm. private mm -hmm. clinics, so it's in different context. True. But, that's you know, true. is it the individuals and the professions yeah. or is it the yeah. systems? I need to take a um, stand-up break. I mean, it's my... my Back is sore. Yeah. yeah, I'm torqued way too much. Yeah. yeah. Do we need a health moment? Yes. I think everyone knows to, this is a social media moment for yeah. you listeners. Hey, <laughs> go check your Twitter account. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Okay, I will hold the tray. Should we pause the. Oh, no. sure. right, yeah. Do you want to press stop? <laughs> yeah, your door should open now. Okay. Oh, yeah, press that button oh, and then he'll there, come and take no, it from us. Chat, I'll just sort of do this or something. <laughs> and I'll be like, oh, we're missing someone. <laughs> <laughs> we switched places. Yes, we have. We're back. We're back. Live. Yeah. From the fun break. break. <laughs> <laughs> we did the tea break. break. A wellness break. A wellness break. Right. Yes, <laughs> a wellness break. That's a good way of putting it. <sighs> so we talked a lot about, we talked about some of the uh, patient activation. We talked about where primary care might be going in the future. We talked a little bit about the risks of burning out our healthcare providers. Um, what do you think, Jennifer, about what are some of the, how do you look at burnout now? Mm -hmm. uh, I know you've gone through quite a bit, bit of a learning journey about it because you're part of so many different tables mm -hmm. when you're talking about it. Mm -hmm. What are the major, I know the electronic medical record system, they always talk about that as being a component of burnout. They talk, well, what are some... I don't know, the electronic record doesn't really bother me that much. Mm. I think, um, I think the, uh, the biggest pro... I think, again, not to sound repetitive, but it comes repeatedly back to the relationship and anything that mm -hmm. affects my does affect my ability to have a re my relationship with my patients will uh, will cause me burnout and and that also it comes back to like mm -hmm. your thing about moral injury right and so anytime that you're in a relationship with a patient and you know what you can kind of see what they need and you can't get it help mm -hmm. them you can't get it for them or you can't mm -hmm. um, facilitate what they need um, it does yeah, it does it get on you. it weighs on you. Mm -hmm. But at the mm -hmm. same time, um, I was just texting with a colleague on the way in, in on my break from this podcast about um, his burnout situation, and I think mm. for me, like moving out of the difficult uh, arena of family practice is not a solution to that because mm. that would just. For me, that would just make it worse. It feels like you we abandoned. Well, I mean, I peaks, think it would just. You know? I, I just could never go back to. I did work in a walking clinic setting when I first graduated. I could never go back to doing that. It's just like soul destroying, basically, to just kind of mm. blow through gobs of people you've never met before mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. kind of band aid them, right? It's mm -hmm. kind of just. Mm -hmm. It's like even more distressing. Though. Yeah. Yeah. It's and you have that pressure of high volume. Yeah, and I, so I would say the, the flip side to burnout is what's what are the protective factors for us, and the protect of protective factor is the relationships. The relationships, like having really meaningful relationships with our patients mm -hmm. and with our colleagues too, mm -hmm. right? With our yes. peers. Yes. Yeah. Yep. And yes. and growing our team, I think that's what it is, and understanding yep. that our yeah. people, administrators at our division, are on our team. Maybe uh, health authority people are actually on our team and. Patients are on our team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's interesting when you say that, like the relationships, and it's very interesting to hear you say that. Um, I uh, I asked my neurosurgeon, and I said to him, this was very recently because I was speaking at two events where we about physician wellness, and I was like, I want to know, I want to tap in. This is a guy who is one of the top neurosurgeons, he is in surgery, he runs a brain cancer um, research lab, he's all over the world, he's, he's super out there. I'm like, 
I want to find out from I'm like why where are you with burnout I'm like how do you manage mm-hmm. to keep ahead of burnout and he said to me he said Clary said um, how I managed to do it is he said it's my patience mm. he said it's mm-hmm. um, I get such joy from my patients and their families he said yeah. that's what keeps me from burnout and mm. I was like wow okay I never thought about that mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I suppose that goes that's back to what you say about it it's is. about it the relationships and I was like wow mm. I said it's and that's where he said he said I, I find such inspiration from them when they've gone through all they've gone through mm-hmm. and then they'll come back and give me a smile or like thank you so much or something like that he said that just mm-hmm. gives me my joy at work he said that just brings it back to me mm-hmm. and he said that just keeps me going and yep. he said that's and, I, I was, and that landed for me I was like mm-hmm. wow okay mm-hmm. so and one, that's out of one yeah but then one mm-hmm. something that's a little bit different in family medicine versus surgery is that a very large majority of the time in family practice we can't actually fix the Fair problem. Enough, he's, yep. Yeah, your yep. relationship is what not we um, have to active. do. What we do yep. is we walk alongside people. We yes. help them to um, adapt, if you yep. want to call it that, to, to whatever it would um, be. Yes. See their bigger picture of wellness. I, I guess so. Where you can. You're totally right. You're right. Yeah. The surgeon is often. Yeah, yeah. He's that's true. Even, even, he's got the cape even, if, it's on, a, even if it's a negative outcome, because it's you know it's yeah. neurosurgeon, so it could be you know, the brain tumor is malignant, whatever. Yeah. But you're right. Then that patient may come back to you. It's it like okay, now I now yeah. need to walk through yeah. the rest of the journey with you. And that's yeah, a very yeah. interesting thing. So that's oftentimes yeah. why we think mm-hmm. that a lot of students go into su- the surgical specialties yes. is because they could fix the problems. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's um, no gratification that comes from that. There is. Yeah. They can take out the gall bladder. Mm-hmm. They can. And you're like, great, you, know, you feel much boom. better now. And that's mm-hmm. one of the things that all specialists kind of get to do as compared to family practices. They get to say, they might see the patient and then say, actually, mm-hmm. this is not what I do. I can't mm-hmm. help you. Mm-hmm. Back you go. Mm-hmm. And there's no such thing as a problem that we don't. Mm-hmm. There's no such thing as not a family yeah. practice problem, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then the patient's coming back to you after you've been the one that's referred them to the yeah. specialist, and we're saying, "Oh, they told us that." Yeah, that's yeah, disheartening. That you gave sent me to the wrong one. Yeah. <laughs> oh that boy, can ha- that can happen. Or you sent me to the right one, but I didn't like that one. I need to yeah. go to yeah. another one oh, of the same goodness. specialist, mm-hmm. and off I go to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Try yeah. this one. Oh, that can happen. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah. So relationship. Yeah, and different types of relationships, obviously, right? Yeah, yeah. With different impact mm-hmm. on the participants. Mm-hmm. And there's actually, um, I think it's is a social neuroscience literature about compassion satisfaction. Mm-hmm. About mm-hmm. Uh, I think Dr. Tate Shanafelt has done a lot mm-hmm. of work on this uh, around looking at at how some of the mechanisms around that what these meaningful relationships and meaningful human interactions actually bring to resilience in, in burnout. So, and I, I think that there is a there is actually something to be said about how we design um, our, our 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 clinical environments and our mm-hmm. clinical relationships, our clinical leadership in, in relationships within hospitals, within divisions of family mm-hmm. practice, where we can allow uh, those types of human connections and compassion compassion mm-hmm. satisfaction mm-hmm. to thrive and, and to yeah. grow more yeah. Yeah. and there are ways that you can make it so you stifle it or you, yes. or you suppress it and i think yes. we've unintentionally yeah. done that a lot you made me think a bit yeah. about um like what you said before um how many hours ago now about um physicians talking about their own flaws or faults or mm-hmm. vulnerabilities mistakes yeah. and so on um and that for me goes to the work of Brene Brown who talks yeah, yeah. about yeah. you know the gifts of imperfection and uh, I think most of us beat ourselves up all the time when we can't mm-hmm. make everything right mm-hmm. um we off what this is I think a cause of burnout which is that we'll throughout it in on any given day we'll, we might have 20 really great interactions and we might have one interaction and with a patient that yeah. goes poorly yep. and that's all we think yep. about for yep. weeks on yep. end and we yep. just beat ourselves up repeatedly over that right yeah. like yeah. you know what i'm talking yeah. about right yeah. like yeah. that one patient that we just can't connect with we can't mm-hmm. get on the same page yep. with we whatever mm-hmm. and we just mm-hmm. 
you know, we just can't move past that or just mm -hmm. recognize our own limitations or set our boundaries around what we can and can't do. Yeah. Um, so does Brown's work help you change your expectations of self in that regard? It does for me. I think it does. Mm -hmm. Yep. I think, I think this, yeah, we, we often feel shame, I think, yeah. when we have those types of situations. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think it helps us to have the language to talk about that. Yeah, yeah, that that, that's actually interesting what you said about the shame. And mm -hmm. just going back once again into that um, podcast, I was just mm -hmm. talking about, and they were saying, you know, there's obviously we know medical error and stuff is, is such a big issue, but they were saying, you know, from the provider's perspective, mm -hmm. no one gets up in the morning and says, okay, right, today I'm going to go out there and do something not nice, or, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. so when there's the, something that happens, it's a negative event. Often the provider feels real shame and remorse. Yes. But how? And and actually had a provider talking about it. So there's actually a nurse who's doing a whole study on this. Mm -hmm. Um, she spoke about it. And she said, you know, there's often this stiff upper lip culture where mm -hmm. something goes wrong and there's no like debrief after it. Mm -hmm. And she said, but there's this remorse that hangs over mm -hmm. the provider. Yeah. And how do they deal with it? And mm -hmm. we're only human after all. But how can we firstly take it as a learning experience? But then secondly, mm -hmm. help help the person to actually move forward and not feel mm -hmm. the shame mm -hmm. and feel, feel the guilt and she said and often just be able to just to apologize mm -hmm. but often we're like no don't don't apologize yeah. don't this don't that yeah. and that's but often I, what yeah. most just I just think that's it. part yeah. of our culture though that's too right. of yes of attributing an error to an individual <laughs> instead of a to system. a system and yes. so usually usually when yes. there's an error that's that like swiss cheese model I right know. like I as know. you know yep. and, um, or even just yep. choice and it's yeah. not an error is that like you know yeah. changing the words changing the income sometimes there are errors right yes. but yeah, in those yeah. moments where it is more simply about choice like I, I find myself thinking about how does the patient change this dynamic? Like you're talking about within mm -hmm. a profession, what your expectations mm -hmm. of are mm -hmm. of yourself and of mm -hmm. each other. Mm -hmm. But how you know? Obviously, we talked about this earlier in terms of mm -hmm. the patient's expectations of their mm -hmm. provider. And I'm thinking mm -hmm. about the role we play as advocates, and that we go and talk to providers, we talk mm -hmm. to systems, we talk to each other. But when do we actually go and speak to patients who aren't advocates? Mm -hmm. And how do we do that about their relationship mm -hmm. with their providers and their expectations of their? provider and being activated mm -hmm. and their role in if we want to talk about the relationship and if we as patient advocates yeah. keep pushing at providers about being mm -hmm. in relationship and what that means how do we mm -hmm. put our money where our mouth is and, and also well, actually extend it outside yeah. of healthcare yeah the traditional healthcare get yeah. you know i don't know like, is that a campaign is that like what is, yeah. how does that look because we're having enough trouble like getting ourselves into yeah. into some yeah. of these closed quarters mm -hmm. but i think there's a huge role to be played by the, the average patient and how do we get that that yeah. understanding yeah. and information yeah. to them i think that's and i think that happens i think that's a very valid point and I think that happens a lot with most of us one-on-one, -on -one, where I know that a lot of my friends are like, if anyone has a healthcare question, go, go to Claire. Yeah. And yeah. it's not just like my friends, it's like, Claire, I've got a friend who has a friend who has a whatever, do you mind if she phones you? I'm like, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So it's more like that one-on-one. -on -one. And I know I've had this conversation with other people where they're like, I often do one-on-one, -on -one, you know, mentoring with other people and how to navigate the healthcare system and so forth. But it's about taking a little bit further than that. Yeah. I think that's a good, it's do, a good, you've given me good food for yeah. that. Does patient voices do anything like that in terms of like how the, perhaps how the ministry uses it to, to, you know, like a public campaign or it'd be interesting to push for something. No, like but that. I think it's a very, uh, you've made, given me some food for thought. Yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah, point. we need to, we, we have a, we have another direction for our voice. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Not yeah. just in, I find that you're right, that's more like an internally facing mm -hmm. voice. Do you know what I mean? Into yeah. the health kit, into the, into the network, system, but I find into, yeah. that there's more like a role for yeah. externally facing Totally. Mm -hmm. Totally. And because oh, we are often thinking. the ones who yeah. are, like I think, like I, I know I think about this in many contexts, like I think about in the maid context, loved ones who come to me very privately mm -hmm. and, and just, mm -hmm. they, the only thing they thank me for is for speaking up. Right, um, yeah. you know, in an alopecia context, because I go overtly bald, you know, you might have someone, you know, in a way, contact me and say, you know, thank you for what you do, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So I take that again, like that notion yeah. of like be, being, yeah. as we talked about earlier, taking it seriously. Yeah. But then, yeah, how do you turn that voice the other direction so that um, yeah. you are challenging the people who appreciate your representation to take responsibility in their own context? It doesn't mean that they have to go to yeah. the microphone yeah. or anything. No. But th they take the microphone up when they're in the office with their provider. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you could put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, food for thought.
Let's see what we can do. Yeah. Just leave it, leave it with us. Okay. <laughs> I'll get out there. In the physician community, there's also being talk about how we need to speak to the public in a more potent way as well to to reduce the misinformation that we feel that sometimes is out there. Mm -hmm. You know, stuff about uh, vaccines or, or okay. about. Um, you know some of the risky therapies that that are not the and and instead and we haven't been able to coordinate that type of mm -hmm. public facing voice and mm -hmm. and then so then we end up having to deal with the fallout of that yeah. on the back end and after yeah. patients uh, have experienced harms and yeah. stuff and yeah. trying to patch things up so it's so hard to communicate with the public now when there's so many other attractive distracting things in in public in the public realm things like you know Netflix and <laughs> Instagram but maybe this right. is the thing in terms of like a specific fix right like I mean this almost comes back to that notion of earlier of community like what is you know what is community in our context mm -hmm. maybe this is the thing that we take forward uh, to the ministry um, or, or what it, where we take it but that as as patients and physicians, mm -hmm. how can we bring our voices together and share two different perspectives as voices, capital V voices, backwards to the user? Um, you know, where where is the space for that so that it can be amplified? Mm -hmm. um, so that there's a, a proactive element of community building and of mm -hmm. activation and of responsibility and, and, and understanding and relationship building. That that's actually not. I'll I'll be bold and say that's actually not that complicated, right? Like it's mm -hmm. just it's asking for a voice to have our voice amplified in a particular channel. It's just saying that this this and this needs to happen, or mm -hmm. these are the biggest gaps or holes. This is just hey, can we talk somewhere, please? So it's interesting because something that I did ask is because I actually was in touch with the Ministry of Health. Oh, I don't know about six. No, not even three months ago because BC doesn't have a patient family advisory. Yeah. Council affiliated to the Ministry of Health, like Ontario does, and quite a few of the other yeah. yeah. territories yeah. do. Julie Drury. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which is like um, dormant now. Yeah, so, but what happens is they have Patient Voices Network, but I feel like there's like a, there's like a missing link there. It's yeah. still yeah. something that should be right with the For Ministry sure. of Health, so they have like Patient Voices and Caregiver Voices right there next to them when the strategy is being planned, the strategic objectives are being the set, picture, it's the bigger, it's the bird's eye view, I'm at the top, I'm sitting at the table with you at the table there helping bringing the voice to the table. But what you say is actually really interesting because it brings another dynamic, right? Because I, I would be, I, I could guess, but I'm sure that when they're setting some strategic plans and so forth that they may have uh, family practitioner input I don't know but it'd be interesting to have like how can you amplify both of those voices when you take at that yeah plan outwards to the public mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so they're everyday I still have that down as a voices. note in my diary to follow up again <laughs> after meeting we was at a common boys at another conference and I spoke to some other people about it and then I go there absolutely should be something that you should speak to them again about because you know when you're setting plans at like a, a provincial yeah. level you should definitely have the patient um, mm -hmm. family caregiver voice incorporated. Yeah. So, but yeah, I love that idea of how do you take yeah, it to the people? Because like, yeah. that does build community. Yeah. I think that's how people see their mm -hmm. their relationship yeah. and their connection and to one another. And and it takes it back another loop as well. Is that if I'm standing with my doctor next to my doctor giving, a, you know what I mean, I, I'm saying like, I'm thinking like on TV, so, but I'm just saying if I'm standing with you and we're having a discussion to the public, we're seen as two people together, not my doctor in front of me, me behind my doctor, whatever. That's an interesting we see, way of you see what I mean? We see, yes. we're, we're together, we're having a conversation mm -hmm. together mm -hmm. about healthcare, how, you know, da, 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 how we see it, primary healthcare, whatever it would be, mm -hmm. and then I'm saying I, it's really important for me that, um, this is why I see it, this is, and then Jane's saying, da, 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 and then I'm saying, it's also really important for me that my physician is supported um, with her team because I want my physician to be healthy. I want my physician to, da, da, because I know if my physician's health and wellness is not supported, I'm not going to receive the quality care that I, I need. So the voice, so you see what I mean? The yes. The patient supports my family physician, which supports the health care, which gives me better health care. So it becomes this like thing, but you can't have that symbiotic relationship unless you're standing together. So people aren't going to hear the end of one until they actually 
here and N of one, and that actually disqualifies all four of the people in this car because none of us are the patients. Not we are not the we are not the patients of you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She's yeah. competing with me. That's a fascinating what? concept. What we need, what we need is a patient and a physician who are both mm -hmm. advocates, who are yes. both voices, yes. who are not just willing to speak from their perspectives, but about their relationships. Yes. yes. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, because that's, that's, that's how you... And what's, Max, thank what's, you. I'm going to take that forward. Yes! Because, no, because I, Where are they? Yeah, how no, do we I, find I, them? I, I can get that because I just spoke at the Canadian uh, Conference on Physician Health in yeah. St. John's and I spoke exactly on this type of thing. And there were we had a whole some. There's got to be Dr. a patient Jane and a doctor. And I have tons advocates. of patients, yeah. but and I haven't wanted to exploit them in that way. Right? No, no, but there's got to be just one out there already who is an advocate. There's got to be. There's, there's got to be a convo. Very interesting. Um, and the other organization that might be interested is the BC College of Family Physicians. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. they're currently doing like a, yeah. a video series. Yeah. And they are okay. sort of doing these videos of family physicians talking about. Medicine. But, but they're, the other, like, but they're not including patients they're because not, they don't want to exploit. You know how we yeah. find this? Yeah. Is not through physicians. It's patient advocates who self-identified. Mm -hmm. We go to our voices mm -hmm. and we ask them if they who have, are who are their providers, mm -hmm. who they have a relationship with, yeah. who do are any of them advocates, yeah. and who who would join them in a dialogue, and then we lift mm -hmm. those two voices up yeah. together. Because yeah. I wow. know. Um, I'll like I'll, 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 I'll send an email checking. tomorrow as well to we see because PJ. they they have a yeah, whole big yeah. thing on physician wellness mm -hmm. and yeah. then it'd be interesting to find out if they have any contacts at BC and say that they're doing this campaign as well. Mm -hmm. But we should throw this at Julie similar. and at, yeah. at Maggie yeah, and, cool. and and at Isabel and yeah. Sue and because that yeah. supports a very united front and it takes mm -hmm. away that hierarchical mm -hmm. sort of paternalistic mm -hmm. relationship and it says hey buddy if you want if you want to have good health care. We have to, um, you what? Hashtag FTS. <laughs> FTS. Yeah, yeah, well, it takes away the patient, yeah. um, you know, uh, patient health. But to have a real side, yeah. relationship yeah. where yeah. two people are both voices. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying is I can see it on CTV news. So that's yeah, why I was, that's totally that's that's why, that's yeah. why I was, that's why I was thinking in my mind was like how to explain it. I'm like I see it as two people having a conversation. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they have to what? be. And there's but there's and there's a little Bre Brene Brown in there too, right? And that there's an authenticity to that because they are actually not just in relationship, but both natural advocates, both yeah. people who, yeah. regardless of that relationship, would want to speak yeah. as mm -hmm. you know the voices from that, mm -hmm. from within that silo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will find them. If you're out there, we will find you. <laughs> um, has the clock struck on? I, I was thinking that we should wrap up and yeah. we should we should tell the viewers how to find ourselves on social media. When I'm back, I'm, I'll be at when Gateway, you are back. When I'm back, I'll be at Gateway Gateway Medic on Twitter. Um, I don't even know my Twitter. I'm uh, I'm Bald Girl B A L D G R R L. No eyes, two R's. I'm uh, at Claire H. Sneeman. That's S N Y M A N. We can find me at twosteps.ca because the surname is a bit confusing. <laughs> Two with uh, T W O or T W O. Twosteps.ca. Oh, cool. And your book, your other book was called Activate. Activate. Yep. Activate. Cool. Available on Amazon. And if I can put a plug in for Sue Robbins' book, which oh, has yes. just come out too, oh, Bird's Eye View. I have it in my car. Oh, Bird's Eye <laughs> View has Bird's just view. has just come out, it's and people best. can't put it down. It's her experience in healthcare. Yeah. Wow. As a patient, and yeah, I know she have it in my car because yeah. I was like, if I arrive early, and then you're like, we're here. I'm like, oh, forget that. You've mentioned a few people. Do you know their handles? Sue Robbins. Sue Robbins is just Sue at, Robbins. At Sue YVR, I think it is. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was somebody Robin PJ. Did, PJ is um, patient critical co-op. Patient critical. He just goes under oh, okay. the hat. At the patient table. critical yeah. co-op. And we and Isabel Jordan is C star Batista. Batista, yeah. Yeah. C star. star S, S E A. S star Batista B A T T I S T A yeah. I believe. Okay. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned some other people. Cancer Geek. I can't, at Cancer Geek, right? Yeah, That's and Andy. Daniel Pepe in Ontario. Is that a GP. Pepe? It's just D Pepe. Yeah. Sue no Robbins Y V R. There you go. At Sue Robbins Y V R. And there was someone other. Oh, Maggie. Yeah, What's Maggie. Maggie's again? Uh, Maggie. Kenneth Stecky. Yeah. 
Hold on. <laughs> that was only really sorry. That one got we us last time. To I think I said Kerr notes, yeah. the last time. It's K E N E S T. No, K E R. Oh, it is K E S T E C I. And we've made, made, mentioned Julie Drury, who's yep. at Uh-oh. Solid Footing. At yeah. Solid Footing, yeah. Um, who else have we mentioned? And of course, there's so many other people. We could probably put sure. an entire list out here, so if we've forgotten, mm-hmm. that's not on purpose. And Jen, who are you? Yeah, Jen, who are you? Jen, <laughs> Jen. <laughs> She's the lucky J. Ross Family Med. Excellent. At J. Ross Family Med. That's me. Right. Awesome. Thank you guys all so much. Oh, okay, thank you. This was great. We could have hung out here for a long time. Until <laughs> totally. the battery dies or the movie dies. <laughs> oh, they say we're closed now. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Bye.